Cool. Okay. This is the deal. Um, for I think most of you already heard this, and Shirley didn't, but she's leaving. Uh, the email that Anna sent earlier today said we're going to go an hour and a half to two hours. We're not going to go that. I'm probably going to be here till at least six. If you have to leave early, that's fine. We are videoing this. The whole purpose of me doing this is to try to get this memorialized on videotape. So if you have to go to the bathroom, fine. Just go around the back. If you have to leave early, that's fine. And then whatever you miss, you can watch on the videotape. So we will probably take a break every hour, hour and a half or so, um, and then we'll get going. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're basically going to go through the entire RPA, um, Residential Purchase Agreement. Um, we're going to do it literally line by line, almost sentence by sentence. We're going to throw in some real life antidotes as far as, you know, you know, certain transactions, certain things that came up, certain things to avoid. So it's not necessarily going to be strictly, you know, the address goes here and the price goes here. Um, we're going to try to, you know, hopefully make it a little bit more interesting and a little bit more real life um, situational type stuff. Um, having said that, we are going to go through it line by line. Now. I have not taught this class in probably three years. I have never taught this class on the new RPA. Okay, So there's probably one or two things in here that I'm going to stumble on a little bit. So if there's somebody in here that's got some different information, keep in mind we're videoing this and we're memorializing it. So if I make a mistake, I'm going to have to cut it out and fix it. So if you know I'm making a mistake, let's cut it out and fix it right there in the video and let me know what we're doing. So um, at any rate, just as a general um, format, ask questions, don't let the videotape and, you know, dissuade you from doing so. Um, and I'd like to keep a dialogue going. So, we're going to get started. We're going to start with the, with the title, okay? Uh, if you've been selling real estate for a few years, and I don't remember, to be honest with you, when they changed the name of the actual contract, which, by the way, this is a contract, okay? It kind of aggravates me a little bit that it doesn't say, California Residential Purchase Contract, okay? The word agreement is a very salesperson word. You know, a lot of us are taught in salesmanship, don't use the word contract because people are afraid of contracts. Use the word agreement because agreements are more agreeable when it comes to people signing their name. Having said that, this is a contract, to make no mistake about it. Um, I understand the word agreement, but personally, I wish it said contract, because I want everybody to understand when they're signing this, it's a contract. So, we haven't even gotten past the title yet, and I would suggest to all of you, when you are signing or having a client sign this agreement, you call it by what it is, or at least once mention to them, oh, by the way, this is a contract, a legally binding contract. Read it carefully. The second part of the title is and joint escrow instructions. That's relatively new. Now I'm going to date myself here a little bit. I don't remember exactly when they changed the title, but if you've been doing this business for any point in time, it didn't used to say and joint escrow instructions. It used to say and receipt for deposit. Okay? So if you have uh, an old school realtor, that calls you on one of your listings or something and says, hey, I'm going to send over a deposit receipt. Has anybody ever heard that? I'm going to send you a deposit receipt. Thank you. Um, if, if you have a realtor that says, I'm going to send over a deposit receipt, or I'm going to meet with my clients to have them sign the deposit receipt, for what it's worth, you're dealing, doesn't mean they're good, bad, or otherwise, but you're dealing with somebody who's been in the business for a while because that's what we used to call this, and the reason we used to call it a deposit receipt is that's really what it was. They would give you a deposit for $5,000, and this, in addition to being a contract slash agreement, it was also a receipt for their deposit, as if you had written them out a hand receipt. I just received $5,000 as a deposit on the purchase of this property. But anyway, we got rid of that, and we said, and join escrow instructions. So what that basically means is your purchase agreement slash contract is also going to serve as the escrow instructions for escrow. Now, does every escrow company accept this as their escrow instructions? No, they don't. Okay? This is, and again, this is not new. We've been using this and joint escrow instructions for a really long time, and I would probably venture a guess that probably 50% of the escrow companies 
say, nice try, but we're still going to type up our own escrow instructions. And the reason they want to type up their own escrow instructions is because they don't like these as escrow instructions. Okay? Um, so, at any rate, however, keep in mind, these are technically your escrow instructions. So if your buyer and seller agree to this and you do have an escrow company that's comfortable with this, all you get is a real basic cover letter that refers back to the contract. All the more reason to make sure your contract is, is, is dialed in and correct all the way around. Okay, we've already gone 10 minutes. I haven't even got past the title yet. So that's the type of class this is going to be. So we're going to go for a long time today. Okay, date. Is that important? Yes. yes. Absolutely. The, why is it important? I'm going to answer a lot of my own questions, but if you want to throw in an answer, just remember speak loud because we've got the video running. Why is the date important? Because it, it's the start. It's a contract, and contract dates are important. Yeah. Okay. Um, which means it's important for a lot of reasons. If you're going to write a contract today, and you're going to put today's date on it, but then you decide that you're not going to basically go to work for the next three days, does that create some problems for your contract? Yes. Absolutely. Agents who write purchase contracts on a Saturday and then decide to go to Vegas and don't present them until the Tuesday when they get back have already created massive problems for their contract because there are certain defaults within this contract that say certain things have to be done and presented within a period of time. So, as something as simple as the date is critical. So normally, what date do you put on the contract? The date they sign. The date they sign it. The date you're going to draft the contract, or the date it's signed. Be careful with that. If you're going to, if you're going to draft a contract in advance of meeting with your client, which is common. I mean, I don't know if that's something you guys practice on a regular basis, but if today's Monday and you know you're not going to meet with your client until Thursday. Put Thursday's date on the contract. Even if they sign at the bottom that they're signing three days later, date it the date they're going to execute the contract. That's always best practice. Um, okay, receive, this is an offer from. This is your buyers. Okay, Sounds pretty elementary. Having said that, I cannot tell you how many buyers agents do not know who their buyers are. Okay, And I'm not joking. Who truly, who is the buyer? Is it John Smith and Mary Smith? Or is it John A. Smith and Mary J. Smith? Is that a big deal? Mm -hmm. Yes. It is not just a big deal because all the banks and the REO companies have a terrible time changing names. It's a problem throughout the entire process. If you get the name wrong in the very beginning, you're going to create yourself uncalculable headaches down the road. What is escrow going to do if you put in John Smith as your buyer? You're now five days before close of escrow and you realize that John, for whatever reason, has to have or wants to have his middle name or middle initial into the contract. What has to be done? You have to amend the contract. You have to amend escrow. You have to maybe change a grant deed. Probably so. Um, maybe the loan documents need to be redrafted. It's a pain in the butt, okay? So this is a conversation that you guys need to have with every single buyer at the time you're writing the contract, or hopefully in advance of the writing the contract. Oh, what's your name? How do you want to take title? John Smith, John A. Smith, John Arthur Smith. If they don't know, stop. Get it figured out. And, and, and believe it or not, you're going to have clients, they're not going to know their name. And I'm, not, I'm serious about this. Well, you know, my birth certificate says this, and I've got a passport that says this, and my driver's license has my maiden name on it, and I don't know who I am. Well, you need to figure that out, okay? And you also need to figure it out as far as spouses are concerned, okay? If you have a client that you think it, it gives you any hint whatsoever, that they're going to add a child, okay? Or they're gonna bring a brother on or something like that. Deal with that in advance. Oops, probably gonna have a whole bunch of those popping up. Sorry about that. Or an LLC. Or an LLC, okay. Um, absolutely, if you've got a corporation that's taking title, 
then you need to get a copy of their Articles of Incorporation, possibly a copy of their bylaws if it's not clear. Who, what is the actual name of the corporation taking title? Something as simple as Pioneer Real Estate Inc. That's the name of our corporate um, parent, okay? Well, is Inc. spelled out as Pioneer Real Estate Incorporated? Or is the true corporate name Pioneer Real Estate INC? Well, there's a difference, okay? Is there a period after INC? Is the true corporate name Pioneer Real Estate Inc. period or not? Is that going to make a difference? Yes, it's going to make a difference. Is there a comma after Pioneer Real Estate Inc. Com or excuse me, Pioneer Real Estate comma INC? You need to know that. And I got to tell you, most of your people that are signing for their LLCs or whatever, they don't know. Get the documents. And then also you need to find out if if it is a corporate document, and once we know the name of the corporation, who's authorized to sign for the corporation? Is that everybody? Probably not. It's spelled out in the corporate documents who is the authorized party to sign for the corporation. Normally, it's by default, it's normally the secretary, but it doesn't... Well, I'm the president of the corporation. Let's take a look at your corporate documents. Have you bought any real property before? No, I haven't, but I know I'm the president. I own the company. Well, are you the authorized sign? Of course I am. Maybe not. So at any rate, something as elementary as who is your buyer, I got to tell you, it's very, very important. And I, I don't know what percentage. I'm going to throw out around a lot of percentages today. Most of them are going to be made up or wrong or could certainly be argued. But a large percentage of offers that we see that come through the office are, are basically wrong right on their face because the buyer's name is wrong. Or they or they want to add somebody or subtract somebody. Yes. Is it safe to assume the name on like the proof of funds is going to be the correct um, like Pioneer Real Estate LLC period comma? Potentially, all that? if you're looking at a bank statement. I'm looking at a bank statement. It may, but I'm telling you specifically if you're going to write offers for corporate entities, you're going to need them anyway. By the way, you're going to need a copy of the corporate documents. You might as well get it in advance. So if any of you are working with investors. Um, and you're probably going to say, hey, wait, we saw three properties today, or we're going to see three next weekend. By the way, we're going to write an offer at some point. Go grab your corporate documents, have them handy. I need a copy of your articles of incorporation, and you're probably going to need a copy of the bylaws. Okay? Um, and if they don't want to provide them to you specifically at that time, you may want to reevaluate whether you want to do business with them. But if they're not providing to you, then you need to, at a minimum, say, well, I want to see a copy of it, at least to make sure we got the corporate name right. And you better be prepared to provide them at some point, because who else is going to need that? Lender's going to need it. Well, if they're going cash, there's no lender. Is escrow going to need it? Escrow and title is going to want to see it. They're going to say, well, who is this? You know, just because you say you're a corporation doesn't mean we're just going to come in and take your word for it. They want to see, make sure it's all proper. Um, okay, so enough about who the buyer's from. Again, very important, though. I can't overemphasize that. Okay, it's pretty important to know this name or the address of where you're buying the property. Complete addresses certainly don't hurt, okay? 123 Main Street. Spell out the word street. I know it's silly, but is it, is it any contractually less valid if you just put ST period? It's still contractually valid, but spell out the word street. Now, Drew will tell you on some of our REO stuff, that by doing that, you may actually create yourself a problem because maybe title has the property listed as 123 main ST period, okay? Those type of things are probably, well, they're certainly not as critical as getting the buyer's name straight, but just as a general rule of thumb, make sure you have the address complete, including the, including the zip code, city, state, and the whole nine yards, okay? Um, assessor's partial number, by the way, this is just the standard win form, so it's just got the basic stuff and fill out. I think everything else on here is going to be blank. Um, take a moment, get the assessor's partial number, okay? It doesn't hurt. It takes 10 seconds to get it out of realist, okay? Plug in the, and by the way, make sure you know what property you're writing an offer on. One of the reasons this is going to take three or four hours to get through this contract is because I have a bunch of stories to tell. The very first story I will tell, by the way, all the stories are true. I haven't made any of them up, okay? Agent in this office, 10 years ago, goes to do a final walkthrough, three days or so prior to close of escrow. 
I will meet you at the property today at four o'clock. Agent rolls up to the property on Main Street, sits and sits and sits and sits and waits for his client. Hmm, where the heck is my client? 10, 15 minutes go by. He looks down the street, sees his client, 10 houses down the street, on the other side of the street, parked in their car. What is the client doing? Waiting for, his Waiting for the agent. They had seen two houses on the same street the same day, got back to the office for whatever reason. There was some confusion as to which property they wanted. The offer was written, accepted, escrow opened, loan docs drafted. We're three days away from escrow, and the buyer thought they were buying the house across the street and 10 doors down. Okay? It happens. You talk about a lawsuit waiting to happen, a lawsuit waiting to happen. Make sure you know what property you're writing your offers on, okay? And again, to the degree that the assessor parcel number will eliminate that problem, it probably won't, but get it anyway. Um, where's the property in? It's in the city of Maria Valley. It's in the county of Riverside or whatever it happens to be. Purchase price, very simple. Write it out, $100,000 purchase price, write in. And again, I know we're typing things in and it's all auto-populated for us anymore. Uh, which by the way, that is the professional and appropriate way to do this. Um, there is nothing wrong with writing a contract by hand. If you remember from licensing school, you can write a valid contract on a napkin and sign it, and that's perfectly valid. And that's a cute story, but that really doesn't fly. Okay? As a listing agent, if somebody brings me an offer that's written on a napkin, I'm probably going to turn them back and say, would you please go get this on a car form? Okay? If they give me an offer that's handwritten, I'm probably not going to turn them back. But if I can't read it, it's completely illegible because their handwriting is just atrocious, um, then I probably am. So be professional. We do not all have fantastic penmanship. Um, and quite honestly, will people judge you based upon how clean your offer is? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You may be the best agent with the most highly qualified client there ever is, but because you have poor penmanship, or like me, I have really good penmanship when I take the time to write. Nice. 90% of the time, I'm in a hurry. And when I'm in a hurry, my penmanship is terrible. Anyway, type these forms out. Do them in win forms. It's the only way to fly. Anyway, our price goes here, of course. The dollar amount goes on the far right side. Very simple. Okay. Um, escrow, close of escrow shall occur on. You have two options here. Okay, you have a date, January 30th, 2012, or you have the checkbox, X amount of days after acceptance, okay? Either one is perfectly acceptable, obviously, because it gives you the option. In my opinion, never, ever use the, the so many days after acceptance, okay? Now again, some of what I'm gonna inject in this course, it, it, to me, is just best practice, okay? As a best practice, I think you're setting yourself up for some pain by putting in 45 days from acceptance, okay? And the reason is, do buyers and sellers easily get confused? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna pull up a calendar. I'm gonna try to pull up a calendar. And we write an offer today. When's 45 days from acceptance? Okay, forget about it. I don't wanna spend three minutes here. But buyers, we wrote the offer on January 5th. Maybe the offer gets accepted three or four days later, but now, a week and a half later, the buyer's looking at the contract that's accepted, and what are they looking at sometimes? Oops, database here. Looking at the date on top. They're looking at the date on top of the contract. Mm -hmm. So when they see 45 days, they may be counting 45 days from this date. The seller may be looking at the same thing, but maybe the contract wasn't accepted until the 7th. Okay, and then when you start counting off days, and I know there's there's provisions in there for weekends and holidays and all the rest of that, you're setting yourself up for a closing date that's problematic. Yes. But sellers are taking so long to respond, and if you put in a date, it could be 15 days after they accept it, and your close date is. Okay, so if we have a date in here that says January 5th mm -hmm. uh, or December 5th, and we put in 45 days from acceptance and then you subsequently get an acceptance you know, three weeks later, how do you address Robin's concern? Look at the date when they, when they accepted it. 
fully executed. Yeah. So you need the signature from the seller. Well, there's going to be a whole bunch of ifs and ands and buts in here. When, how, when does this contract normally? I don't want to jump ahead to page eight. Three days. What's the default? The default language is three days. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our mo. Our let's take a survey. We're off camera, so no one's going to see this if you're watching it on video. Mm -hmm. On day four, five, six, eight, fifteen, twenty-two, after the offer has been written, are all of you subsequently going in and saying, "I've extended the acceptance period for the buyer." No. None of you are doing that. This contract is dead. This contract is dead three days after it's written unless it's been accepted or unless there's some other language in the contract that says acceptance period is extended or now the seller signs you, sends you back a fully executed contract, no counteroffer. The date is well beyond three days after acceptance and you have had no provision in for that. Is your contract subject to question at that point in time you should go through even if it's nothing more than writing in the margin by the way the close of escrow date is x buyer and seller agree blah blah blah, blah. we've extended the acceptance period till buyer initials here seller initials here now again is that the cleanest way to do it probably not but even we used to do this all the time you put something in the margin over here that says this is what we're going to do a counter offer basically buyer initials it, seller's initials it, and dates it, is that valid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Getting Not to get too hung up on the date, though. This is why I like hard dates in here. Number one, you sit down with your client. And again, I understand some of what I'm talking about is not real world. And I understand real world is you're not going to get an acceptance in three days. Um, but if the buyer needs 45 days to get their loan approved, Count it out, figure out where that falls. Well, maybe that falls on a, on a Saturday, okay? Maybe there's a holiday in here. By the, by the way, have you guys ever considered that when you're writing an offer and you're going to close in 30 days or 45 days or 60 days and everything's great and you're all of a sudden, oh, geez, there's Lincoln's birthday, it's President's Day that week. Is that going to cause a problem for you? Absolutely going to cause a problem for you. Okay. Now, the obvious ones are the Thanksgiving and the Christmas. If you're scheduling escrows to close the week before or the week after Thanksgiving or Christmas, you're asking for pain. Okay? You're asking for pain. So be thoughtful when you write these offers up. But I like to get a calendar out with my client, pick a date, make sure that there's no conflicting holiday, three-day weekends, or any nonsense like that. Get the lender on the phone. Hello, Mr. Lender, Lance Martin, Cobo Banker Pioneer. I'm sitting down writing an offer for Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. They say that they can close in 45 days. Can you close in 45 days? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Are you positive? Yes. Okay. I just want you to know I'm making notes. I talk to the lender. You guarantee me you can close this escrow by January 13th. Okay. Yes, I can. That's the type of con who has that conversation with the lender prior to writing an offer. If you're not having that conversation with the lender prior to writing an offer, you're setting yourself up for failure. Invariably, what happens? You've chosen a date because you and the buyer think that's convenient for the buyer's timeline and for your commission timeline, with no regard for the seller, or frankly, in this case, more importantly, the buyer's lender. Can the buyer's lender get it done? So I am a big advocate for give me a hard date, okay? Now, if you've given a hard date, and that's approximately 45 days, and it now takes you two weeks to get an acceptance, okay, then you need to deal with that when you get the acceptance. Hello, Mr. or Mrs. Listing Agent. It's the buyer's agent here. Thank you very much for your acceptance. It took you two weeks, however, to get that. Based upon that delay, we can no longer close on January 14th. We need January 13th. And by the way, tell them that in advance. If you're dealing with an REO agent or just a regular seller that basically says, hey, I have, um, 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 it's going to take me two, three weeks to get, tell them in advance. Oh, just so you know, if it is going to take you two weeks to get this accepted, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to have a problem with this closing date. I'm going to need, which kind of gets back to Robin's point. Well, how much? Yeah, I think I'm going to need about 45 days from acceptance. Well, then why don't you just write 45 days from acceptance? Because I want to know what the date is. I want to know the date I'm closing. I want everybody to be perfectly aware 
Uh, and I got I cannot tell you how many thousands, probably tens of thousands of dollars I have personally paid to clients because for whatever reason they thought they were going to close on a Friday and they could not close until the following Monday or Tuesday. It doesn't matter whether I represent the buyer or the seller. Sellers have plans, moving trucks are in the driveways, people need to be moving in, people need to be moving out, and you, as the agent representing them, have let them down because their expectations fell short. Which, by the way, they're gonna fall short all the time. But you wanna tighten them up as much as you possibly can. So I like solid closing days. Okay, um, all right, very well. Okay, I'm gonna adjust this here just a little bit. Okay, we're gonna run on to um, agency. Okay, the agency disclosure, and again, I have not taught this class on this contract, so I may have a couple stumbles here and there. Um, it's been a while since I've taught this. But right now, we've got an agency disclosure, as soon as it stops. We've got an agency disclosure, first and foremost, very clear, right in the beginning of the contract. Buyer and seller each acknowledge prior receipt a disclosure regarding agency relationships. Okay, at what point are we getting our clients to sign an agency relationship disclosure form? Before you write the contract? Well, sir, at, a, at the latest, before you write the contract. Technically, when should they be signing the agency form? The first time, the first time, the first time you're taking you're them out. Yeah. Okay? Is it difficult sometimes for, for buyers? Well, you what? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to see the house. What do you, I don't want to sign nothing. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, why don't you practice your closing skills a little bit? You know, Chris talked about doing some classes on closing and so on and so forth, and we're going to do some of that stuff in the next three weeks. But, you know, why don't you try it? Say, no, 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 it's not a contract, which it's not. The agency disclosure form is not a contract. You're not committed to pay me a commission. You can work with whoever you want. All that the agency relationship form says is that I've, just by the fact that I'm talking to you, and certainly by the fact that I'm going to go show you this house, I'm creating an agency relationship with you. Would you please sign this? Now, if you don't take it to that step, before you have them put the date and their name on paragraph one of the contract, you do need to pull out an agency relationship form and you need to have them sign that. And keep in mind, if they won't sign an agency form, what makes you think they're going to sign a purchase contract? They're not. Okay? So at any rate, you've got your agency form, and by, that's mandatory. This is not a, you know, I'll do it every other file. This has to be done and it needs to be done in advance of them signing the contract at the latest. And technically, it should be done at the time you have that first appointment and you're certainly out showing property. Now, is that standard or practice across the industry? The reality is that's probably not the standard of practice for most agents. That should be the standard of practice for everybody in this office. If you're not doing that, I don't want you to run out of the room and go get everybody to sign agencies because you showed property this weekend. But the next time you get that client in front of you, pull out the agency relationship form. Explain to them what it is. Okay, so we've got our agency form there. Um, competing, potentially competing buyers and sellers. Buyer, yes, I am going to read some of this contract to you guys. Buyers and sellers each acknowledge receipt of disclosure of the possibility of multiple representation by the broker representing that principal. What that means, and again, if you're not doing this, you should. There is a form, C-A-R-D-A, dual agency form, and especially in a large office like ours, okay? If we're a mom and pop office with five agents, the need for this is minimal, okay? We're not mom and pop. We've got 180 agents, we've got five different offices all working under one broker's license, mine, and the possibility that there's dual agency is enhanced, okay? All of this is doing is it's telling your client it's possible that there may be Either, the, either you might be working with another um, buyer who's interested in the same property. Somebody else in our office may be working with it, which is entirely possible based upon the leads that flow through the office. If you get a, an up call for 123 Main Street, is it a pretty good chance that there's somebody else in the office who's working with the buyer at 123 Main Street? There it is. Potentially competing buyers and sellers. Now this also, talks about, we're talking in the context of the buyer's agent right now, but let me put my selling agent, excuse me, my listing agent hat on. If you are a listing agent, is it possible that you have more than one listing in the same neighborhood? Yes. You have an open house or somebody in the office has an open house on property A, 
but they like property B, they're both listed by the same agent, is the seller going to get mad at you or the buyer going to get mad at you? Because, wait, hey, you wait, you were holding my house open. How come you wrote the offer on the house down the street? Well, because that's what the buyer wanted. Okay? So this does go both ways. So this, this especially, we have more large office. We have five offices in five different cities. So this is important. So if you're not using the DA form, which I think is the dual agency form, I think that's what that stands for, um, you need to basically do that. And they were just, just disclosing to the buyer and potentially the seller um, that you may be representing more than one client. Okay? Now I will tell you as a matter of practice, if you individually are writing offers for different buyers on the same property, I would suggest you do not do that. You are asking for big, big challenges. Okay? Because again, you need to be able to represent to the best of your ability both of those buyers in that transaction. In your heart of hearts, you know which offer is better. Let's suppose the buyers are equally solid, credit, income, the whole nine yards. You're representing buyer A, they write an offer for $100,000. You represent buyer B, they write an offer for $105,000. Okay? Do we disclose to buyer A that buyer's B offer is higher? Mm -mm. No. no. Now you could, but you'd have to then disclose to both people. Yeah. Hey, I told them what your offer is, I told them what your offer is, and then you end up with this crazy back and forth until they finally know. So anyway, it's, it's challenging. Um, so if, if you're in that situation where you do ultimately have a buyer or multiple buyers for the same property, you might want to consider partnering up with somebody in the agent and, and, or somebody else in the office and say, hey, I had an open house this weekend. I'm writing an offer for Mr. and Mrs. Jones. Mr. and Mrs. Smith came in an hour later. They want to write an offer as well. Hey, Shirley, would you mind writing this up for me? I just don't want to. And tell the clients. Tell them point blank. Wait a minute. How come you're not going to write an offer for me? Yeah, because I'm writing an offer for these folks. Okay? It's a best practice. Generally speaking, you're going to be in better shape. Confirmation. We know what goes here. Listing agent. This is not you. Okay? This is the company. Coldwell Banker, Pioneer Real Estate, or if you're in the town and country or Realty Center office, the name of the firm goes here. Who are you representing? In most cases, the listing agent, unless, it's, unless you pick this buyer up through an ad or open house or whatever, the listing agent is going to be representing the seller exclusively. And the selling agent, again, who are we? Coldwell Banker, Town and Country, Realty Center, Pioneer. By the, we're not putting all three in there, by the way. You work at Coldwell Banker, Pioneer Real Estate, you write in Coldwell Banker, Pioneer Real Estate. If you're exclusively representing the buyer, of course you check that box. Not to dissuade you from representing both buyer and seller. If you happen to double end one of your listings, that's fantastic. But make sure you're checking the appropriate box. It's very, very important. This used to be buried, not buried, but I think this used to appear somewhere like on page four or five. Um, it's such an important issue that they literally moved it up to above the financing. Okay, They want to make sure the buyers understand exactly what they're dealing with when it comes to who's representing who. Let me move these paragraphs up a little bit more. I apologize why this is going to fluff flutter. Um, okay, getting into, by the way, you guys any questions so far? Good. Okay. Getting into financing. Uh, frankly, page one and two of the contract take the longest to actually explain and go through. Um, we haven't even gotten halfway to the bottom or halfway through page one. But they're also, quite honestly, where people make the most mistakes. Okay? First of all, if you're not comfortable with the financing section of the offer, you should not be writing an offer. Okay? Go to your sales manager. Come see me. Um, make sure you understand what goes in these blanks. Also, you need to lend, lean on your lender. If you have a lender that you've developed a relationship with, ask them some of these questions in here. Make sure you got it straight. Okay? There's a few of these things as far as loan amounts that we tend to play a little fast and loose with. That's not really necessarily what I'm talking about. But you need to know what kind of financing your buyer's doing, what sort of down payment are they doing, do they need closing costs, are the seller gonna pay for the closing costs, is the buyer gonna pay for the closing costs. You've got some basic stuff, but let's start with 3A. Um, buyer um, represents that funds will be good when deposited. By the way, this is a big change, and the first thing we're gonna talk about is the deposit, okay? Very, very first thing is the deposit. Um, before we get to the deposit, because I don't want to skip ahead, because we're going to come back and talk about the deposit when we get to a later page, um, liquidated damages clause is something that we're going to spend some time on. So when we get to that part of the contract, we're referring back to this particular 
paragraph, page 3 or paragraph 3A. The earnest money deposit based upon what liquidated damages will allow is a maximum of 3% of the sales price. Okay? So, generally speaking, if you are writing an offer, and let's just keep the math simple, $100,000 purchase price, okay? You should have a deposit. Now, again, this really depends on who you're representing, but for the moment, let's just suppose we're representing the buyer, okay? The maximum deposit that you probably want to put down on a $100,000 purchase price is 3% of the purchase price, or $3,000, okay? Now, if you put down a deposit, I'm going to get back to that in a minute. If you put down a deposit of $100, or $500, what type of message are you sending to the seller and the listing agent? Not really. You're sending a, a bad message. I don't have a serious buyer, I don't have a strong buyer. If you send an offer with a, a, a minimum of a 3% earnest money deposit, at least myself as a listing agent, and if I'm going to talk to my seller, the message that I'm going to send is the buyer is prepared to put at risk the maximum amount of damage is allowed under the liquidated damages clause. Does that make your offer look stronger? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, now if you have a client who's just absolutely dead set on making their offer look as strong as they possibly can, and they say, well, I want to put down a $50,000 deposit, because what message does that send to the seller? They want it. These people are really serious. And as much as I, representing the buyer, may want to send that super serious message to the seller, and if I'm the listing agent, do I love that? Yes. I absolutely love that. But what's the problem for that? Again, right now i got my buyer's agent hat on. The buyer has said, I want to show extreme good faith, and I'm going to give them a 50% deposit. Okay? Don't confuse deposit, by the way, with down payment talking deposit, earnest money deposit, EMD, okay? I want to send a super strong message. I'm the buyer's agent. I say, yes, great, give me that 50000 bucks. The seller accepts. We open escrow. What happens to the deposit? It gets zero. deposited. We now have a problem. I don't know what it is. There is a problem with this transaction. And let's suppose for the moment the problem is of absolutely no fault of the buyer. There's a title problem. The, the sellers are divorcing and there's been some craziness going on and we've come to the conclusion that guess what this escrow is not going to close and let's use the example I just used the sellers are getting a divorce escrow is open on a hundred thousand dollar property with a fifty thousand dollar deposit that belongs to my client pretty straightforward you guys don't want to sell your house right right okay let's sign cancellation instructions Oops. Oops. What has to happen for the buyer to get the 50 grand back? Mutually agreed upon and signed escrow instructions disposing of the deposit. The husband is gone or upset. I'm not signing anything. What have you, what have you just done? You, you represent the buyer. Have you represented your buyer well in that transaction? No. No. You have not. Because the only way the buyer is going to get that $50,000 back is through time and or litigation, okay? So as much as we might be excited to come in and throw this gigantic earnest money down, and even though the client, the buyer, may say, no, I want to do it because I know there's 20 offers on here. I tell you what, forget about the, 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 the I'm going to put the whole thing down as a deposit. $100,000 deposit, right now, here's a check, boom, okay? As, as excited as you may be representing the buyer, you're the professional. You tell them the story I just told you. No, 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 we can't do that. Now, if you want to give me a bank statement that says you got a million dollars in the bank and you want me to submit that, that's some good faith, yeah. but be wise when it comes to the deposit. So, Jen, now again, put my other hat on. I'm now the listing agent. Now, again, if they came from an agent in this office, I probably would have a conversation with you. But let's suppose the ABC Realty writes me an offer with a $50,000 deposit on my $100,000 listing. Am I going to call them up and say, hey, um, you know, it's probably a little heavy. You might not want to do that. You're putting a lot of money at risk. And then, No way I'm not going to do that. No. Absolutely not. I'm going to get my seller to sign that sucker, and I want that $50,000 because they are what? 
Committed. Committed. They are absolutely committed. But anyway, be careful with the deposits. Having said that, if you are not collecting an earnest money deposit that is at least one and a half to two percent of the sales price, you need to reassess your buyer. Okay? I like three percent. And you need to prepare your when's the time to prepare your buyer on how much of an earnest money deposit that they need to be prepared to submit when they write an offer. When you first start working with when you're very, when you're working in the very beginning. Oh, well, that doesn't look like they're going to buy for a month or two. That's okay. You're showing them the house. Have the conversation. Oh, just by the way, I know we're not buying a house today, but we are going to be writing an offer at a property at some point, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Now, if the answer to that is Maybe. no, <laughs> or, oh car. no, we're not. We never plan on writing offers. Well, okay. Oh Assuming, by the way, is that a good closing technique? <laughs> yeah. Is that a good? It's a good closing technique. Yeah. Hey, I know we just met, and I fully don't. I don't expect you to write an offer on this house today. You haven't even seen it. Um, but you do plan on writing an offer on something within the next thirty days. Thirty days, and that's an open-ended question, by the way. Yes, it is. Within the next, pause for effect. Okay. Wait for them to fill in the blank. They're gonna get. Oh yeah, within the next thirty days. Within the next six months. It's reasonable. Oh no! Well, no, 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 no. We're not. No, we're not looking. I mean, we're not gonna buy. We're just looking. We're just. We're here from Seattle, and we thought we'd just spend the weekend with you. Okay. Okay. But at any rate, if they say within the next thirty days, let's use Diana's example. Yes, we're gonna buy within the next thirty days. Okay, great. Just, just so you understand, are you prepared to put down a deposit equal to about three percent of the purchase price? Pause. Oh well, how much is that? Well, three percent. We're looking at about a two hundred thousand dollar purchase. About six grand. Oh no, we can't. We don't have any money. <laughs> okay. Again, ask the questions. Prepare them in advance. The last time, the first time you want to talk about how much the deposit is going to be should not be at the conference room table. They should know well in advance that you are going to ask them for a check equal to a certain dollar amount. And if they tell you the story, oh yeah, we bought a lot of houses and we only write, we only put down a hundred dollar deposit. Now was the time to have that conversation, okay? So at any rate, 3% sounds good, right? Okay, there's some language in the contract that's been changed dramatically from where it was even since the last revision. And the revision of this contract, I think, is, is um, I think it's October of last year. I think it's, a, we're about a year, a year and two months old. But this is new, okay? Now, I'm going to give you two different scenarios here as it relates to what you're going to do with the deposit, all right? One of them is you want to control, that's probably a bad word, you want to ensure that your buyer is committed to the transaction as much as possible. Okay? In doing so, when you write this deposit and you ask them for a check for $3,000, you want them to make that check payable to the escrow company if you know who it is, and we haven't even got to that, that's at the near, on page two, or you can have them make the check payable to Cobalt Banker, Pioneer, Town and Country, Realty Center, whatever it happens to be. Okay? And in that particular case, you want them to hand you a check. Okay? When they say, oh, by the way, I'm going to need a check today. Give me that check for three grand. Okay? Now, in, under that scenario, from a sales perspective, that is probably, got to be a little bit more on top of this, that is probably the best way to approach your buyers by basically controlling the transaction, making sure that they understand that they're going to need to come in with some money. Oh, and by the way, that remember that deposit I talked about? Now is the time for you to give it to me. Okay. Now, the challenge with that is, unfortunately, a lot of the agents are then not disciplined very well to make sure they handle the, the trust funds, which is what this becomes as soon as they hand you a check for $3,000, irrespective of who the check is made payable to, even if it's made payable to ABC escrow company. You now have trust funds. That has to be accounted for in our trust log, has to be accounted for three business days, all of this sort of stuff, okay? Now, as much as I would love everybody in the office to be collecting these checks in advance, accounting for them property in the trust log, the, the attorneys, quite honestly, at CAR have realized that this is a problem and a lot of real estate agents are failing when it comes to properly accounting for the deposit. <coughs> so what they've done is they've, they've kind of changed this a little bit. Deposit shall be in the amount of $3,000, okay? Buyer shall deliver deposit directly to escrow holder 
I like that. By personal check, that is the default. You don't have to check electronic funds or anything else. The default is buyer shall deliver deposit directly to escrow holder by personal check, leave everything blank, within three business days after acceptance, leave everything blank. What has that done as it relates to our responsibility as the buyer's agent in handling the trust funds? No. It has completely taken us out of the loop. That's right. Now, the bad part of that is, if you have not had a strong conversation with your buyer that says, okay, you are not going, which by the way, the old language used to say, buyer has delivered to buyer's agent $3,000 buyer's initial deposit, buyer's agent shall deliver to escrow within three days. This comes in this trust fund handling issue that we've talked about. So if you, if you, and by the way, when CAR produced this form, this is coming straight from the attorneys, they have tried to make this form so that there is as little checkbox and fill out as possible for the realtors. So when it comes to the deposit, the default is covered for you. Now this is the conversation you need to have with your client, okay? If this offer is accepted tomorrow, per paragraph 3A1, you need to prepare a personal check and deliver that to ABC escrow company within three days of acceptance. If the buyer does not do that, the buyer is in out of contract. breach of contract or out of contract. Yes, they are in breach of, we're going to talk about this a lot. Oh wait, come on, it's only day five. Okay? The contract says three. Now again, so we're in an REO cycle right now. We're in, we're in a completely different market. Let's pretend we're not in an, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm not going to couch this discussion based upon REO business. I'm talking contractual across the board. Let's pretend for a moment. Um, Shirley is my seller. I am the listing agent. Chris is representing a buyer. Chris writes me an offer that generally is acceptable to Shirley's terms. Shirley signs the offer. No counter offer. Fully accepted. Rock and roll. Okay? We open escrow. Chris need, Chris's buyer needs to do what? Get the deposit in within three days, correct? Right. On day four, Shirley calls me and says, geez, Lance, this guy was just walking by my house. I was out getting the mail. He says, this is, this is the house I want. It's beautiful. I explained to them that I've already got the house in escrow. I just accepted an offer. But this guy says his mom lives across the street. He wants to be in this neighborhood. He's willing to offer me $100,000 more than what I have it listed for. <laughs> okay. Contractually, can Shirley cancel our deal? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure she can. Absolutely. Yep. No and she's gonna, and, and again, we haven't even gotten down two inches from the top of the first page. Can, right. We're all going to be looking for the reason to cancel, or we're going to be looking for the reason to enforce the contract. Cancel the contract, enforce the contract. This is one of dozens. So it is extremely critical that your buyers, or if you're responsible, if you've taken possession of this check, you don't want to have to be the one that tell, calls your buyer and says, oh, geez, um, we're in breach of contract. The seller just canceled. Why? Well, because we didn't get the earnest money deposited in, in time. Well, what do you mean? I gave it to you, agent. Ag by the way, getting back to the agency, agency relationship. I have a fiduciary duty of the utmost honesty, loyalty, that, 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 in all dealings with my buyer, right? Mm -hmm. Did you possibly breach your fiduciary duty yes. to the buyer yes. mm -hmm. by not getting this in on time and now yeah. basically causing them to lose their dream house? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at any rate, getting back to the deposit, I like this. Now, I know there may be some sales managers in some of my other offices or maybe even some sales trainers or even agents in this room or watching this video that say, no, 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 Lance, I want to make sure that buyer gives me that check and I want it in hand because I want them committed. All I say to you is, fine, do that, but if you don't have it properly documented in the trust log and you're not prepared to document that every step of the way, don't do it, okay? Because number one and number two violation from the Department of Real Estate. Trust fund mishandling and failure to supervise agents.
trust fund mishandling and failure to supervise agents are violations at what level? Broker level. It's my violation. Okay? So if we don't handle that deposit straight, I get in big trouble. Okay. So, or number two, and this was kind of the default previously, you check the box. This is what we're probably not going to do. Buyer has given the deposit um, by personal check or money order to the agent submitting the offer. That's the scenario two we just talked about. If you do that, make sure you have a document. I think we've beat that horse to death. By the way, made payable too. Um, do, we all, do we always know where the escrow is going to be opened at? No, we don't which is one reason why a lot of agents like to get the deposit in advance and they want this to be made payable to the brokerage. Okay, make it payable to us, Cobalt Bank or Pioneer Real Estate. And then we can either endorse it and send it over to escrow or we can put it in our trust log and then we can cut the check. Um, but if you do that, just make sure you've got it done properly. And then the deposit shall, again, same rules, deposit shall be held uncashed until acceptance and then the deposit to the escrow holder or the broker's trust account. Again, same rule within three days of acceptance. Now again, acceptance. I don't know what page it's on. We're going to get to it. Is this one of the words that's actually defined in the contract? Mm -hmm. Get the little page. I think it's on page seven. It says, you know, definition of terms. The fact that they have to define what the word acceptance means in the contract, does that mean that people start counting on different days? Well, I started counting on that day and you started counting the day after. It's a mess. Anyway, the earnest money deposit is a big, big deal. Coming from your broker, it's my violation. I would prefer that all of you stick with item A, okay? Now, if your question is, wait a minute, the seller insists on seeing a copy of the check when I submit the deposit. That's fine. Have them write the check, make a copy of it, and it back to them. You now have a copy of the check. It doesn't change a thing. Okay, you're still stick with paragraph 3A1, okay? You now have a copy. Check made payable, escrow to be determined, any reliable escrow, whatever it happens to be. Now, I would be careful that you make sure you are very clear with this. Just because you have a copy of a check, the assumption probably is, well, if you have a copy of it, you must actually physically have the check as well. Mm -hmm. So make a notation. The buyer provided a copy to submit with the offer. Always make a sign that that was returned to them. Okay. Very well. Okay. Very well. And I suppose someone could make the argument right then and there, and maybe that's the argument that you're making, is, well, wait a minute. They handed you the check to go to run to the copy machine. Have you now, are you now part of the chain of custody? Maybe you are. Maybe you need to send them over to the copy machine. <laughs> don't hand that check to me. I don't want to touch it. Because now if I touch it, what do I got? I got to go to trust log. I got the check. What would you do with it? I made a copy of it. What did you do? I gave it back. Okay? Yeah. Trust fund handling is a big deal, guys. It's a big, big deal. And it's important that we do it properly. Okay, so here we've got our check. I think we pretty much covered that. Okay, increased deposit. I cannot tell you how many times I see, let's just, let's just make up a hypothetical for our transaction, $100,000 purchase price. We've already agreed the buyer is going to put a 3% down, so we've got $3,000 up there in the corner. Let's pretend for a moment it's a 20% conventional. Let's keep it simple. Um, so what's the balance of the down payment going to be? $17,000. That goes here, right? No. No, it does not. This is increased deposit, not increased down payment. Okay? So the increased deposit is if the buyer is going to increase the deposit subject to liquidated damages within a certain period of time, it goes on this line. So let's use our $3,000 deposit, for example. I want to give $3,000 deposit, but all I have today is $1,500. Okay. I will increase the deposit another $1,500, um, which would go here. Okay. And when will I do that? I will do that five days after acceptance or 10 days after acceptance or put a date on December 15th. That's payday, whatever it happens to be. So the only time this increased deposit line is used is when the buyer is increasing the deposit, not to be confused with down payment. Again, I could throw out a percentage. I would be guessing. All I can tell you is almost 100% of the time when I see an offer and this is filled out, it's wrong. Their intent is not 
to increase the deposit. Their intent is, oh, well, that's the balance of the down payment. Is that important? Yes. Okay, let's, pre let's go back to my example with Shirley for a minute. And let's pretend as the listing agent, maybe I'm not the brightest bulb on the tree either. Shirley has accepted the offer. It's got a $3,000 earnest money here. And the balance of their down payment is going to be how much? We said 20% down. So we put $17,000 here when it should go down here. But we put it here. And the default is what? Is there a default on this? Ah, the default increased deposit. Um, oh, there is nothing. Which, by the way, normally the agents do what? They leave a blank, which is a problem. Can't leave. You're going to do it. You've got to put something in there. Counter offer number one, which would say, even if I, was, I wasn't the brightest listing agent, well, how many days are you going to do to do that? But let's suppose someone put three days in there. What have you now committed your buyer to do? Bring in more money. 20, bring in more money. $20,000 earnest money deposit. Let's suppose they haven't done that. Now what? They are in breach. breach. Shirley now has the buyer that comes up to the mailbox. She calls me up. And I say, no, 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 you can't cancel. Because I don't know what I'm doing. And then Shirley says, well, have you read? Which, by the way, have you guys read this? I got again, another, I have no way to quantify this. A large percentage of realtors doing business today have never read the contract. They filled them out, but they've never read them. Shirley says, Lance, have you read the contract? Well, yeah, I've read the contract. Well, I may be new at this, but this says increased deposit, not increased down payment. Have they put the deposit in within three days? Because if they have it, they are in breach. There is nothing worse than your buyer and or seller reading you the contract and interpreting it in the proper way. And then you're like, uh, what? Holy crap. Oops. Well, let me talk to my broker. Okay. So at any rate, increased deposit is just that, increased deposit. And again, if you're going, and there are reasons you're going to want to do that, but normally this is going to be blank. You're not going to increase the deposit. Okay. You're just not going to do it. Okay. If you do, subject to liquidated damages. Okay. Okay. Loans. This is, again, seems to be a stumbling block for so many people in our business. Let me bring this up a little bit. Now, do we do loans in this office? No, no. Good, good, because we don't do loans, okay? Do we coordinate with um, outside lenders on occasion to facilitate loans on behalf of our clients? Yes. yes. Of course we do. Okay, now I've given you a simple example in this particular transaction. Buyer's going to put down a 20% down payment, an 80% loan. They're going to get a loan in the amount of what? $80,000. So $80,000 would go over here, okay? That's pretty simple. The default in the contract is this loan will be conventional financing. If you check nothing else, it is assumed we're getting a conventional loan, which for lack of a better description is everything other than a VA or an FHA loan, okay? Um, so, now again, if they're doing an FHA or a VA, can the loan amount sometimes be a little fuzzy? I'm not really sure because you only know, finance it. Talk to your lender. That's right. Talk to the lender. How much is their FHA loan going to be? The lender will tell you. She will say it's going to be X. Then put that dollar amount in there. Okay, don't guess. You should not be guessing on This is a what? Contract. Contract. We don't guess on contracts. When you start guessing on contracts, you don't get paid, and neither do I. Okay? So talk to the lender. Now, if it's, if it's a basic conventional loan, 10% down, 20%, then that's pretty easy. Is it harder to figure out the FHA loans? Yes. yes. No. Talk to your lender. So anyway, we're going to put in our balance there. Okay? Now, again, if they're assuming some financing, it's probably pretty rare that you're going to do some seller financing or assuming some financing. If you are going down that path and you have, are not familiar with the SFA, which I think is the seller finance addendum or something like that. Um, if you're not familiar with that, or if you're not familiar with the PAA, which is the PAA, okay, <laughs> stop. Talk to your manager, talk to your broker, figure this out. I would venture a guess that most of you will go through your entire real estate career 
and never do a seller finance, which is a seller carry back basically, mm -hmm. or a seller going to finance the finance loan in one form or another. If you do, are you arranging financing? Yes, you are. You would better know what you're doing. Okay? You would better know what you're doing. Okay. This should, now I'm going to come back over here. This loan shall be a fixed rate, not to exceed X. How many times do you, most people leave this blank? Most, 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 most of the time you leave it blank. Or an adjustable rate with an initial rate not to exceed blank. Can you leave these blank? No. No, you, no, you well, not only shouldn't you, no. This is not one of these options where it says this loan will be conventional financing or if you see the or word, then you get to play with some options over here. Do you see anywhere on here the or option? It says this shall be a fixed rate not to exceed blank. Now it does give you the or, but even if it's an adjustable rate, you have to check the box and you have to fill in an amount. So if you're representing a buyer, you need, again, who do you need to talk to to find out what this is? Lender. Your lender. Mm -hmm. Hey, what have you quoted them? Have you given them a um, estimate. You, estimate of how they have lived? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No. No. The terms. Have you given them, oh, I draw them blank. The terms. Okay. You're giving you, good Lord. You give them the disclosure form that says how much their loan and payment is going to be. It'll come to me in a minute. Okay? So we need our interest rate in here. Okay, let's suppose you put in 4.125 um, uh, interest, okay? If the buyer cannot get along, let's suppose interest rates jump overnight to 5.5% and the buyer can no longer get a 4.125 fixed rate. Does the buyer have a out? Yes. Yes, yes they do. Yes, they do. Okay? Now let's suppose you put 6% in here and all day long they can get 4, 4.5, 5% loans. Does now the buyer have an out because the interest rates are too high? No, they don't. They're committed. Drew, is this looking good on the screen? I know where it's getting darker in here. Is it still okay? No, it looks good. Are we okay? Mm. Yeah, I guess. Okay. But at some point, we're probably going to have to turn on at least the light in the back. Otherwise, we're all going to be blind. No, um, he's talking about on the, on the video. I'm talking on the video. Okay? But there, there, you should have an interest rate in here. Right now, we're not doing a lot of adjustable stuff, but if, if your lender and your client and you have discussed it and you think an adjustable rate loan for your buyer would be best, then you check the box and you put it over there. Okay? But this needs to be filled out. Now, I've, I've heard back and forth on this. When I was representing buyers, what I always used to put is best available. Now, I've heard, no, oh, that's a challenge putting best available. I'm okay with it. I'm your broker until someone receives the video and tells me that's wrong. I don't have a problem with you putting best available. Having said that, what does that do to your buyer? That basically says, if the interest rates go up and you can still qualify, you're still a buyer. So if you put best available in this box when you're sitting at the conference table with your buyer, you need to explain to them, oh, by the way, I'm putting in here best available interest rate. What does that mean? That means if the interest rates go up to 7% overnight, and you can still qualify for a 7% loan, you're still contractually obligated to buy the house. Are you okay with that, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer? No, I'm not. Okay, well then let's change this. What's the maximum interest rate you would be comfortable with? Okay, so you need to make sure. By the way, it takes a long time to write an offer, folks. If you write an offer and you have your buyer in and out of that offer in 15 minutes because you're good, I would suggest you're not taking the time to explain this offer to your client. We're going to take three to four hours to go through this contract today, okay? If I'm sitting down with a client, if I'm not spending at least an hour going, I don't go through it necessarily in all this detail, but if you're not going through every paragraph of this contract with them, you're not doing your job. You need to spend some time with them. Will you have clients that say, no, 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 come on, I've done this before. Yeah. Yes, you will. Okay, well, if you insist, but I really would appreciate it if you go home and read it and talk to me tonight and make sure you've gone through this. Call them the next day. I know you were in a hurry when we wrote the offer last night. Did you really have a chance to go through and read it? Specifically this, 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 and this, which is basically everything on page one through eight. Okay? You want to make sure they understand what they're getting themselves into. Okay, where was it? Um, okay, this loan, blah, blah, blah. Regardless of the type of loan, buyers shall pay points not to exceed. Do we need to put something in there? 2%. 1%, 2%, 0%. This, what, what you're saying here is 
how much closing costs in the form of points, which is kind of funny because nobody really uses points anymore. It's, that's kind of an old term um, word. Um, but if the buyer says, I don't want to pay anything in loan fees, then you put what? Zero. 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 Okay? If the buyer, now today, in this market, and this video was being made forever, I'm not doing this for, you know, December 5th, 2011, hopefully this will hold the test of time in five years from now, will it be common for buyers at some point in time to pay their own closing costs? Yes. Yes, it will. Yes, okay? It will. We have all been accustomed for the last several years that the buyers don't pay anything and the seller just pays it, we ask it, and they pay for it, right? Right. Kind of, sort of. But at any rate, there needs to be something in here. Um, and in most cases, in today's market, it's probably zero. Down the road, the market will shift, and the buyers will say, yes, I am prepared to pay my own closing costs. Okay? So we put a number in there. Okay, if it's an FHA or a VA offer, okay, if FHA or only. So our specific example is conventional, so this would not apply. Let's deal with the FHA anyway. For any FHA or VA loan specified above, the buyer has the default 17 days, you can change it, that's not enough time, I need 32 days, change it here, after acceptance to deliver to seller written notice, CA farm, CAR form, FBA, of any lender required repairs or costs that the buyer requests seller to pay for the repair. This is normally done in the form of what? The appraisal. Okay. Lender require, require repairs on a property the lender does not go out to the property. Your loan rep that you're dealing with does not normally go out and say, oh, the place looks great. No problem. Or, wow, the roof looks a little rough, or this looks a little rough. That is done in the form of the appraisal. So the appraiser is going to provide an appraisal, which is going to have a few things on it. This is how much the property is worth, which is normally what the buyers and sellers are thinking of when they think of an appraisal. They think, well, they're just going to tell us how much it's worth. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're going to give us opinion of value, but they're also going to give us the lender require repairs. Okay, that normally has come through on what's called a VC sheet, a Victor Charlie sheet on the appraisal. But this specifically says, the contract specifically says that whatever those repairs are, they have to be provided on a FBA form. Has anybody ever used it? Just recently. Yeah, it's not commonly really used. It. Yeah, Gosh darn it. It's not commonly used. It's more commonly used um, on the, um, basically normally what ends up happening, you send the appraiser over to the listing agent um, and say, hey, guess what, we got some repairs. Listing agent normally says, send us over a request for repairs, which is not the FBA form. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then, but either way, it's kind of the same thing. I don't have a problem with that. But bottom line is, if uh, and by the way, can this also even though this says FHA VA, does this also apply to conventional financing? Can the eventual, a conventional appraiser come out and say, we will give you a loan with a 20% down payment. However, you have to do the following things. Absolutely, okay. But this this tightens things up. 17 days, which basically means you have to get the appraisal done in 17 days from acceptance. Okay, which may or may not be easy. Okay. Now, it also says request the seller to pay. Does that say that the seller has to pay? No. No. Seller has no obligation to pay the repairs or satisfy lender requirements. None. Okay? Unless otherwise agreed to in writing. So if somewhere else in the contract, the buyer and the seller agreed, seller agrees to pay, which may be a good place to put it, might be right here. Mm -hmm. Seller agrees to pay up to $3,000 to satisfy any lender required repairs. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, that's great. There's a problem with that. The only problem with that is that we don't know. Okay? Okay. And, and, and this is, this is partial. Let's, let's suppose we think that there's going to be some lender required repairs. So we're really, we're cute. And the listing agent knows everything. Hey, I don't think this is going to go FHA. There's going to be some repairs. So I tell you, why don't, let's just throw in, why don't you ask $3,000? Let's deal with this in advance. You, you talk to your seller about it and say, no, okay, yeah, that's 3000 bucks. Okay, so you put it in writing. The appraiser comes back and the appraisal has zero repairs. What does the buyer want? The buyer wants three grand, yeah. right? Yes. Because they just say, wait a minute, that other seller is getting free money. So you got to be careful when you put these dollar amounts in here. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you're probably better off advising your seller, we may have some repairs. Maybe put that $3,000 on their net sheet. 
and put on there possible FHA, possible appraisal repairs, but don't contractually obligate them to it because if you do, and it's, let's suppose it's less than that, let's suppose it's only $2,000, buyers feel gypped, okay? If you don't put it in the contract and there's nothing there, buyers don't feel gypped, okay? Now having said that, be realistic. Let me put my buyer's agent hat on. You know in your heart and soul there is no way this property will close escrow without lender required repairs and in your estimate it's going to be $3,000. Representing the buyer, who do you want to commit to pay that up to $3,000? You want to commit the seller. So put it in here. Do your job representing the buyer. You know, seller agrees to pay, which is, which is addressing this sentence right here. Seller agrees to pay a maximum of $3,000 towards lender required repairs. You can get fancy in the event there are no lender required repairs, buyer will not be credited back. Or you could do this just the opposite. You could say in the event there are no lender required repairs, seller agrees to credit the $3,000 towards buyer's closing costs. Or agrees to do whatever. Now, is that stuff going to fly? Probably not. Drew's over there shaking me off, and I understand that. But, but it's best to address it in advance, okay? Address it, especially if you think that you're going to have some lender required repairs. So that's where you would put it. Now you can also put that in, um, uh, there's a lot of other things you can put in here. Closing costs, seller agrees to pay X amount of dollars towards buyer closing costs, which by the way, if you're going to ask the seller to do something that's going to cost something, tell them how much it's going to cost. I don't like percentages. Seller agrees to pay two points towards buyer's closing costs. Two points of what? What is technically a point? A interest rate. A percentage. One, per, one point is one percent of the, no, the loan amount. But that's a perfect example. Somebody may say, we'll get a hundred thousand dollar purchase price, seller agreed to pay two points, that's two grand. Well, wait a minute, our example is twenty percent down, eighty thousand dollar loan, two points is not two grand, two points is sixteen hundred dollars. There's confusion there, okay? So, I don't like up to 3%, 5%, 10%, 20%, baloney. How much money do you want? Seller agrees to pay up to $3,000 for lender required repairs and an additional $2,000 towards buyer's closing costs. Including but not limited to. Now that gets to be another thing. Well, what defines a buyer's closing cost? Well, figure it out. Loan fees, escrow fees, title fees. People argue over these things, okay? Um, so define, if you're going to say seller agrees to pay $2,000 towards buyer's closing cost, define something that you know will cost at least $2,000, including but not limited to. I love that language in a contract. Buyer, excuse me, seller agrees to pay up to $2,000 in buyer's closing cost, including but not limited to buyer's escrow fee, title fee, 1% loan origination fee, 1% discount point, buyer's processing fee, home inspection fee, whatever. Do the math real quick. Hey, that adds up to 6,000 bucks. Cool, we got $2,000 of it covered, okay? <laughs> but put a hard dollar amount in there. Okay, balance of purchase price. What goes, to or, or down payment, not to be confused with deposit. In our example, $3,000 earnest money deposit. Balance of purchase price is $17,000. That's what goes over here. And then the total purchase price goes on the last line, which is $100,000. Which I'm not going to scroll back up to the top, but for those of you that have your own contract in front of you, that should match the purchase price up at the top and what's, what's written out in length. So we've got our total purchase price of $100,000. Okay. Page one, Woo, hour and 20 minutes, it's getting warmed up. Okay, if, and again, just for those of you in the room, if you've got to leave, I have no problem, just get up quietly and go to the, out on your own. When I'm done at eight o'clock tonight, I think there'll be nobody left in here. But at any rate, um, page two is gonna take about another hour, page three, four, five, and six, we're probably gonna do in about an hour. So the, the remaining six pages of the contract go pretty quick. The first two pages are always the longest. Okay, obviously who initials here? Buyers, all of them. Did I say all of them? Yes. Okay. If you have multiple buyers, well, there's only room for a three or for two. Well, if there's a third one, there's nothing wrong. Put it a third. If it's the corporate secretary of the corporation, then that's who they are. 
By the way, if it's the president or the secretary, the LM secretary, LM president, okay? Even on the initials. Normally they're on the signature line. I say have them put their title next to their next to their signature or their initials as well. Okay, we're on the top of page two. Okay, Bear, by the way, do we need dates on every page? Yes. yes. Yes, every single page needs to have a date on it, and they all should be the same. Okay? Um, so we've got our date of the contract, verification of down payment. Pretty straightforward. Having said that, the boilerplate language, buyer or buyer's lender or loan broker, pursuant to paragraph 3H1, that's on page 1, shall within the default seven days. If they need more time, check the box, put in 10 days, 20 days, whatever it happens to be. But within seven days, the buyer or their lender or their loan broker shall provide to the seller, deliver to seller written verification of buyer's down payment and closing costs. Okay? And if checked, verification. So what this is saying is the buyer, through their representatives, need to basically prove to the seller within seven days that the buyer has all the money. Now, a lot of times we want to get this when. We don't want to wait seven days. We want it in advance. Okay, we want it at the time they are. Hey, you say you have $20,000. Prove it. Give us a bank statement. Okay, but that's assuming that didn't happen. By default in the contract, you change nothing. You don't check anything. Buyer is committing to deliver to the seller within seven days of verification. Not only of their down payment, there's this fancy little extra little two words over here. When you tell a buyer they're going to buy this house and they're going to put 20% down on a $100,000 purchase price and you tell them they need $20,000 basically down payment, right? Do all buyers, are all buyers sophisticated enough to understand that they're going to need more than twenty thousand dollars to close the escrow? No. no. <laughs> because there's what else? Closing costs. So now this is the deal. If we go back to page one, the buyer has given three thousand dollars already, right? Now they're getting ready to close. You tell the buyer, hey, we're going to close on Friday. So get ready to bring your your money, and escrow is going to tell me exactly how much it is. Your buyer. As smart as you may think they are, some of your buyers are going to think, okay, honey, we got to take down the 17 grand, right? Mm -hmm. Escrow then calls them, or you call them, and say, okay, you need to bring down $21,000 or $20,000. And they instantly say, oh, no, no, I already gave you three. You only need 17. Oh, you aren't counting that you have closing costs, escrow fees, title fees, insurance, property taxes prepaid, loan fees, loan origination, points, all this wonderful stuff, okay? Which is why this is, that's not a good time to have that conversation with your buyer. Not a good time at all. Does that happen all the time? Has anybody in this room had that happen? I've had it happen on the listing side where I've had buyer's agents call me, I got it, I don't know, 10, 15% of the time. We're getting ready to close, we're a day away, the agent calls and says, oh, the buyer doesn't have enough money to close. What do you mean they don't have enough money to close? Ah, they weren't figuring on the closing costs. All they had was their down payment. Nobody told them, oh, good faith. Good, that's, what, that's the word I was thinking of earlier. Really. They, the agent or their lender, nobody gave them a good faith, which by the way is required by law, that the lender at the time they take an application provide a good faith estimate of everything associated with the transaction to the buyer. The good faith on it has what? Closing costs. Down payment and closing costs. Which is why if we're just grabbing lenders off the street to doing loans with our clients, or you're letting your buyer use their cousin to do the loan. When I say letting, the buyer's decision. But we're the professional. You have to sit back with your buyer and explain to them, okay, if you're going to have your cousin do the loan, I need to talk to him. I want to see the good faith. I want to make sure that everything's cool. I want to make sure you understand 
that it's not just going to be $20,000 to buy this house. It's going to be $20,000 plus. Okay? Very important. But anyway, whether you check a box or not, by contract, the default is seven days to provide this information to the seller. If you don't get it, can surely cancel. Yep. Period. Done. I, I'd, be, I, I'd stand behind you all day. I never got verification for the contract. It's now day eight. I'm canceling. Period. Oh, no, here it is. Doesn't matter. You should have been here yesterday. It's today's day eight. I'm can. No, 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 please. No, I'm canceling. Remember the guy at the mailbox? He's going to pay me more. You're out. Okay? Now, are you going to have a fight on your hands with the buyer? Maybe. But I think the contract, you're going to do the hold up and you're going to win. Okay, loan terms. The default, if you check nothing, okay, the default is very simple. If the buyer has not already, which they should have already, okay, but if they haven't already taken a loan application with their lender, they have to within seven days. If you're writing offers for clients and they have not already filled out a loan app, stop writing offers for your clients, okay? I don't care how excited they are, okay? Have them fill out a loan app. If they've got enough time to sit down with you for two hours and write an offer and, and, and all the rest of that, oh, I've been showing them property for three weeks, and they've talked to the lender, Okay, they've talked to the lender. You've been showing them for three weeks. They just talked to the lender. You haven't already got them apt. You need to you need to consider why you're not asking these people to get apt. They need to get apt. If they're serious buyers, getting back to that as original questions, when do you plan on buying a property? Are you prepared to come in with an earnest money deposit? Have you submitted a loan application with anybody yet? No. Yes. Okay. Well, if it's no, great. Do you have a lender you're working with? No or yes. It doesn't matter what the answer is. If the answer is no, let me connect you with, with our, you know, a preferred lender. Here's two or three names, okay? If yes, I'm working with my brother-in-law. Has he taken your loan application yet? Has she taken your loan application yet? No. When do you plan on doing that? Oh, I thought we'd wait until we got our offer accepted. I got a better idea. How about you do it tomorrow? How about you do it today? Okay? Why? Are you going to buy a house in the next 30 days? Yes. Do you want to get a jump on this now? Oh, I guess I never thought about it that way, okay? All of these things, the whole goal of this four hours, the goal here really is not to teach you guys how to fill out a proper contract. It's to get you to an escrow that you can close, okay? Because if you're asking some of these questions in advance, you're probably, probably 50% of all the buyers that you think you're going to write offers with in the next 12 months, if you're asking them these questions as we go, you're never going to be writing offers with them. And that's a good thing. That is a good thing. You're going to leave them in the driveway of that house because they're non-committal on when they're going to buy. They're definitely not going to give you an earnest money deposit. They won't tell you how much down payment they have, and they'll never commit on a loan application. Is this the type of buyer you want to spend the next three weekends with? We don't get paid unless we close escrows. We are professionals. Act like it. Don't run around and be taxi drivers that don't get paid. This is nonsense. You need friends, go to the bar. Okay? So, at any rate, loan application. Seven days. Buyer shall deliver seller a letter from lender. This is normally your pre-approval letter. By the way, don't get hung up on, I've got a pre-qual, but I have a pre-approval. That's better. Okay. They're pieces of paper. All right? Now, if they give you a direct endorsed underwriter signature, this loan is approved, okay, that's a little bit better. But, you know, I want to, oh, that's not a pre-approval, that's a pre-qualification letter. Nonsense. If you just have a letter from ABC Mortgage that says, Mr. and Mrs. Jones are qualified to buy a house up to $110,000, based upon income credit, da -da -da -da, it means nothing. They're, me they're meaningless. Um, but that's what this is asking for, though. It's saying we have an application, and we've basically been... Pre, again, they use the language. Buyer is pre-qualified or pre-approved for any new loan. Bottom line, we all know they're not approved until what? Until they're approved and the loan's funded. Quite honestly, they ain't approved until the loan's closed. Mm -hmm. then, they're, then they're approved. Okay? But anyway, seven days. Loan contingencies. This is the default. Loan contingency. Buyer shall act diligently and in good faith to obtain the designated loans. Obtaining the loans specified is a contingency of this agreement. Unless otherwise agreed in writing, buyer's contractual obligations to obtain and provide deposit 
and down balance of down payment and closing costs are not contingencies of this agreement. But what is? The loan. Mm -hmm. If the buyer cannot get the loan, what happens? Yeah, See ya. And what happens to their earnest money deposit? It stays there. Mm -hmm. if, if they, it, it's contingent. They get their deposit back. Yeah. Okay. Well. They get their deposit back. Now, ah, dang it, I'm going to have to be more diligent. Sorry, guys. That's only like the fifth time that's happened. Okay. So, let me click on this. Okay. All right. The default contingent, the default in the contract is the contract is contingent upon financing. Okay. That is the default. The default in the contract also is, does that still look okay on the screen? Yeah. Okay. Good. The default in the contract also is 17 days. So the loan contingency removal, within 17 days of acceptance, buyer shall as specified in paragraph 14, which we haven't gotten to yet, um, in writing, buyer shall as specified in paragraph 15, 14, in writing, remove the loan contingency or cancel this agreement. So the loan contingency is in place by default for 17 days. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't check anything, and this would be the box that you would want to check, that. If you're representing the buyer and you want to make sure that the buyer's loan contingency remains in effect basically until it's funded, you have to check this box. Then the loan contingency shall remain in effect until the designated loans are funded, which is literally until it's done. Okay? Now, representing a buyer, if there's any doubt in your mind, any concern in your mind that the buyer may have a challenge getting the loan and getting it funded, number one, you probably need to be direct consultation with the lender. Why? Why are we not sure? Okay. Um, but number two, if, 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 if it is a little iffy and you still proceed to represent them, you better check this box for the benefit of your buyer. Okay. This is truly 100% for the benefit of the buyer. Who do we represent? At least in this scenario, we're representing the buyers. So you need to check that. Now, an argument could be made, well, wait a minute, by checking that, you're sending a message to the seller, to the listing agent, that my buyer's not qualified. Well, if you're worried about sending that message, and you're confident that your buyer can qualify, and your buyer's confident that they can qualify, and the lender's confident that they can qualify, then don't check the box. And then, or just take, check this box. No loan contingency. We are so solid that this offer is going to be not only accepted, but that this buyer can obtain the appropriate financing. That then again, this is kind of this is the default, 17 days. This box takes it out till the loan is funded. Doesn't matter whether you're an escrow for 100 days. Doesn't matter. Or no loan contingency period. If you're checking the box, no loan. If, if I'm the listing agent, if I'm the seller, if I'm Shirley, I like this. These people are solid. So basically, if they cancel, or deal falls out. This is not, the loan is not going to be the reason, okay? It might be another reason. There's a, there's a dozen other reasons that they can fall out and cancel, but it's not going to be the reason, okay? So again, know your buyer. Also know that if you don't check anything here, buyer has 17 days to get full loan approved. If, they don't, if, if on day 18 or the day before close of escrow, oh, we can't qualify, something came up on the credit, oh, okay. Well, you, the buyer, of course, can still cancel. What is this referring to? Damages, liquidated deposit, the three thousand dollars that's in escrow. Okay, so they're basically tied in on their on their loan contingency. Okay, appraisal contingency. Let me bring this up. Now, this is a separate deal. Okay, um, apologize the way this is going to scroll. Um, while we're waiting for this to come up, the default is is that the contract. A contingency of the contract is the appraisal. Okay, so if the property does not appraise, um, then all bets are off. Now, hopefully this will stop here in a second. Stop. Stop. Okay. Appraisal contingency removal. This agreement is forget about this contingent upon a written appraisal of the property. If you want to make it so it's not contingent upon an appraisal, you have to check the box. Have to be licensed, they have to be certified, and again, it has to be at a price no less than the specified price. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Now, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. 
If there is a loan contingency, buyer's removal of the loan contingency shall be deemed removal of the appraisal contingency. So the default, as with the loan contingency and the appraisal contingency, is 17 days. So if you cannot get the appraisal done within 17 days from acceptance, and the appraisal comes in low on day 21, well, guess what? That's not a good reason for them to cancel. The seller is now going to be entitled to their deposit. Their buyer is going to be in breach. Who do you need to have these conversations with? Loan contingency and appraisal contingencies. Does the buyer know? Yeah. Buyer doesn't know. Buyer's going to count on you and the lender. So you need to talk to your lender. Is this enough time for you to get the appraisal done? Is 17 days enough for you to have full, formal, unconditional loan approval? If it's not, you need to check the box and change the, term, change the term, kick it out a little bit. Now again, I'm kind of varying off the actual contract part of this class, but it, we're professionals. You've now been showing this buyer some property. You've now got them to talk to your lender or you've spoken with the, their cousin and you, you need to have a professional dialogue with them. Are they qualified? Have you checked their income? Is their employment? Do they have the down payment? Is all of that stuff lining up? What kind of loan are they doing? Are you able to get these things funded? Are your FHA appraisals backed up? You need to have that dialogue. If the lender on the other side of the transaction is not answering these questions to your satisfaction, you need to share that with your buyer. And frankly, if it's a lender that you recommended, you need to take them off your recommended list and find somebody who, who, who's going to be able to answer these questions. So find out when you're writing this offer or in advance, is that enough time in today's market? You know, well, the last time I did it, it was no big deal. We had the appraisal done in seven days. It was great. Well, the last deal you did was two years ago. Okay? Market's a little different. Maybe people are backed up a little bit now. Okay? So make sure you're asking those questions. But as a default... The appraisal is a contingency of the transaction, okay? Um, and again, it runs with the loan contingency. All right. Um, one other thing really quick. Appraisal buyers checked and writing. The appraisal contingency cancel the agreement. Um, if there is no loan contingency, we check the box. If there is no loan contingency, buyer shall, as specified in paragraph 14b3 in writing, remove the appraisal contingency or cancel this agreement within... 17 days. Just because there's no loan contingency does not automatically remove the appraisal contingency. Okay? Unless you specify otherwise. You know, right here. No appraisal contingency. Okay? Normally there's always an appraisal contingency if for no other reason you want to protect your buyers. I mean, what if the appraisal comes in loan? The problem is if the appraisal comes in low, number one, you got a problem because the house is now not worth what the buyer thought it was, or at least in the appraiser's mind. And number two, who's going to have a bigger problem with that? The lender. The lender's not going to fund the loan. They, they fund the loan based upon a value set by the appraisal. If that loan is, is less, you've got a challenge. Now, on some transactions, a transaction like this, a 20% conventional, let's suppose the appraisal comes in a couple thousand dollars light. Could the buyer make up the difference? I really want the house. I think the appraiser's crazy. I have no problem. I'll pay an extra $2,000 for the property. Sure, but I can do that all day long. Can they do that on every deal? No. FHA's not going to let them do that. VA's not going to let them do that. Low down payment conventionals, they may not be able to do it. 20% conventional. Lenders probably said, I don't care. I'm going to do my loan to value based upon this value. If you want to come in and give the seller an extra two grand, so be it. Okay? But again, all of that stuff is, is, is open. Okay, cash offers. All cash offers, if checked, buyer has seven days from acceptance to deliver seller verification of sufficient funds to close this transaction. Okay, if you are writing an offer that is all cash, I would strongly suggest that you do not wait seven days. You have the proof of funds at the time you're writing the offer. I will tell you, and I learned this lesson years ago. I'll ne well, I guess I, I was going to say I'll never forget. I already have, I forgot a long time ago, but I'll make this story up. Probably the first time I had a buyer come to me and say, I'm a cash buyer. I was probably certainly within the first year or two of my real estate career. And I don't remember, but if I had to guess, I was probably really excited. Mm -hmm. Cash buyer. Cool. How easy is that? 
And then I realized pretty quickly that, wow, this guy's junk, okay? No money, they didn't really have cash, they said they had cash. And then my personal experience with cash buyers was the majority of the buyers that came to me and said they had cash did not have cash, okay? So after being burned a little bit, I learned pretty early in my real estate career that when someone came to me and said, I'm a cash buyer, great, great. if you're a cash buyer, give me a bank statement. <laughs> Come on, this is me you're talking to. I understand that. Give me a bank statement, okay? Because what do some cash buyers produce? Well, I opened up my mail and I got this thing from my bank that says, you've been pre-approved for $350,000. Oh yeah, you and everybody on your block got that same letter. That's not cash. What are you talking about? Okay. Or I have a workers' comp settlement, and it's going to close any day now. Okay. Shirley's giggling. I know we got a few new people here in the office. If you ever have your client tell you they're getting their cash down payment from a workers' comp settlement, then you better. Um, not cash your commission check. Workers' comp settlements either never settle or they take 300 years to settle. I've never been able to close a transaction ever based upon a buyer telling me their cash is coming from some sort of legal settlement. Okay? At least I've never been able to close it within a year or two of the time they originally told me <coughs> that they were going to have their settlement in the next two weeks. Okay? So if you have those type of buyers, run. Um, or have them provide a legitimate source of funds. Now, along those lines, what's a legitimate source of funds? Well, this traditional, a bank statement from a bank that you are familiar with, I mean, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, you know, whatever, okay? And if there's enough money in the bank, is it liquid? Ask them the questions. Oh, I see that this is a CD. Can you get it? Well, yeah, but you know, I really don't want to close until January 5th because if I do, I have a penalty. Well, I understand that, but we've written this offer to close before Christmas. Well, that, yeah, well that's a problem, okay? Well, don't forget that that's a problem because let's suppose you write the offer to close on January 6th and now the seller counters you to December 31st, because that's going to be better, and now all of a sudden the buyer forgets and you forget that, wait, we had a problem with the CD maturing. What's going to happen? Can the buyer get their money out of the CD early? Yes. Are they going to forfeit some interest in the penalty? Yes. Are you prepared to do that, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer? If you are, great. If they give you a stock um, certificate, something from Smith Barney or, or Merrill Lynch or something like that, are those funds liquid? How quickly can you get them? Okay. If it's coming from a retirement account, a teacher's account, or something like that, are they liquid? How, how, well, oh yeah, sure, I can get them. And then you find out later that, yeah, you can get them, but you've got to fill out a form, and it's got to go to the administrator, and then three weeks later, with a pint of blood and a notarized signature, then you get the money. Okay? So, is the money liquid? And again, if that's the case, that's fine. Get those questions answered in advance. Write a cash offer. Put, the, put, put a 45-day escrow cash. What's the first thing that the listing agent and the seller is going to say? Why do you need so much time? Well, tell them. This is why I need so much time. Here's the statement from Solomon Smith Barney. It shows that they got $300,000. It's there. It's not a problem. Well, why do you need? Well, because we're waiting for something to mature and you don't want to pull it out, and this is when they're going to pull it out. Know that in advance. Okay? Save your deal. Know it in advance. Okay. Um, buyer's stated financing. Okay, this is another thing. What this is talking about, are we still good? Okay. Yeah. Um, what this is talking about is the s buyer's stated financing. That means whatever you put on page one, I'm going to do conventional financing with 20% down. The seller accepted your offer based upon buyer stated financing. Conventional financing, 20% down payment. Seller has relied upon the buyer's representation of this type of financing, blah, 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 including but not limited to how much is the down payment? Is it contingent? Is it non-contingent? Is it cash? If the buyer chooses to try something different, the seller is under no obligation with the buyer's efforts to obtain that. So in other words, 
you say you're going to write cash, then prior to close of escrow, your buyer tries to go out and get a hard money loan or tries to go out and get an FHA loan. This basically says, no, 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 that's not what we accepted. Now, normally speaking, if the buyers can close within their certain window of time and, and they change the finance of their down payment, the seller probably won't care. But of course where this becomes a big deal is, oh, I'm not going to put down what I said I was going to put down. I'm going to change from cash to VA. Um, and oh, by the way, I need an extra two weeks to close. Problem, okay? So again, a conversation that needs to be had with the buyer. If you've had a buyer that during your conversations while you've been showing them property and writing the offer and they're vacillating, oh, we're not really sure if we're going to go with FHA or, you know, they're going to be 10% conventional or 10% conventional or 20% conventional, you need to sit back and say, oh, by the way, on page one, this is what we agreed to. <coughs> it sounds like since page one, you've already been talking about maybe putting down less money or whatever. Now, obviously, if they put down more money, the seller could care less. But the bottom line is, you need to have a conversation with your buyer. You just can't change the terms of the contract. The seller accepted it for a reason. And if those reasons change, the seller has every right to, every, every right to cancel this deal. Okay, um, allocation of costs. This is probably one of several or, or clauses within the contract that will ultimately end up costing everybody in this room and on video commissions. At some point in your real estate career, even if you fill this out perfectly, you are going to be paying some closing costs or a cost that you probably should not be paying. And in most cases, if you're making those, those you're paying those costs, you're probably paying the cost is because you failed to fill this out properly or you misunderstood. You just flat out didn't know. Okay? Probably, certainly one of the more important paragraphs in the entire contract. And it's so simple if you just take your time and go through it. Number one, allocation of costs is just that, okay? Allocation, who's paying for what, okay? And the reality is if there's a mistake, there should be another box under here that says the agents pay for it, okay? So it's pretty straightforward. Unless otherwise specified in writing, this paragraph only determines who is to pay for the inspection, the test, the service report mentioned. It does not determine who is to pay for any work recommended or identified in a report. So, that specifically talks about a couple of things. Let's start with the beginning one. Most transactions have a request for a termite inspection on it, okay? If you're going to ask for a termite inspection, um, all that this says is that either the buyer and or the seller is going to pay for a termite inspection. The reports, 45 bucks, 75 bucks. All that this says is that you're going to give them a report. It does not say who then is going to pay for the work, if any. Okay? So, with that being in mind, and again, traditionally, buyers ask the seller to pay for a termite inspection. That's fairly common in, in Southern California. So, if you're representing the buyer, you check the box, seller to pay for an inspection and report wood destroying pests and organisms, which, by the way, you notice. A termite inspection is not called a termite inspection. They're not just checking for termites. They're checking for wood destroying pests. You know, it could be carpenter ants. Okay? Carpenter ants are part of a wood, they're wood destroying pests. Probably didn't know that. Okay? Could be um, fungus, you know, the stuff growing out of the eaves on, on a roof that's been leaking. Okay? So, um, anyway, who's going to pay for the report? And then, of course, we have an opportunity here to say who's going to. Um, what company do you want to use? Most buyer's agents will either pick a company or they'll put in the, the traditional, any reliable um, or seller's choice. Okay. Normally, if you're going to ask the seller to pay for a wood-destroying pest or an organism report, the, the kind thing is to let them pick who they're going to do it. But you may not want to do that. You may want to say, no, no, I don't want to, I don't want to um, have them go some fly-by-night company. I want them to use ABC Termite, whatever it happens to be. But we will put that in there. Keep in mind, this does not address who's paying for it. Where do we put who's going to pay for it? The WPA form, the Wood Destroying Pest Allocation form. So if, 
if you now also want the seller to pay for the cost of any correction, you have to put that on a separate form. And that separate form basically is going to be the form that's going to um, identify um, who's going to pay for it. Oh, and by the way, seller pays for the cost too. Okay. By the way, for those of you that are accountant, we're going to run through this. It's going to take about 10 minutes. Um, we're going to take about a five minute break. Uh, and then you know, I may be talking to an empty room, but then I'm going to come back in and I'm going to finish this. Um, so at any rate, so that just from a time standpoint, it'll take us about another 10 minutes to finish this and then we'll take a quick break. Okay, so we've got our termite report. Septic. Okay, first of all, if you are a listing agent and or a buyer's agent representing a buyer, it is imperative that you know if this property is on it, has a septic tank or whether it's on the public sewer. If you don't know that, number one, you should not be listing that property. And if you're representing the buyer, you should not be writing an offer on that property. You need to find that information out in advance. Okay? This should never be a question. Okay? And if you don't know, don't just start checking boxes and saying, oh, this doesn't pay for everything because I don't really know. Okay? Do your due diligence. If it is on, now again, keep in mind, the same rules apply for all of these inspections. If, you're, if it is on a septic, and you want to have that basically pumped and certified and all the rest of that. Asking the seller to have the system pumped and inspected by ADC company, does this say certified that it works? It does not say that. All it says is that have the septic or private sewage disposal system pumped, pump out the crack, and inspected. Looks good. That costs what? 400 bucks? 450 bucks? Okay. Oh, we pumped it. We've inspected it. Oh, the leach field is is full. No more. We need a new leach line. Does it say who's paying for the leach line? No. So if you're going, if you have a property with a septic tank, this just addressed who's paying for the septic sir. Okay. And we throw that language around, by the way. I just did it by accident. This talks about pump it and inspect it. Does not certify it. Okay? Buyer's agents check this ball. Oh, yeah, we asked for a septic cert. What's a septic cert mean? Well, well, cert probably means it's certified that it works. That's not what this says. It does not anywhere on here say certified that the septic system is fully functional and working. If you make a mistake here, who's going to pay for this, maybe? Are septic systems expensive? Yes. yes. Okay. It can cost you maybe a hundred and fifty bucks for a cracked lid. That's an easy one. Or you could spend thousands, multiple thousands, ten thousand dollars for a new system. You certainly can spend a heck of a lot more than your commission on a transaction like this. And it goes both ways. Okay. If you're representing the seller, know what you got. By the way, if you have a property and you just, you, oh, geez, ah, there's termites everywhere, oh, this, this septic is, the sellers, t oh, by the way, disclosure issues, the sellers, oh, yeah, we got to get the septic pumped every three weeks. Is that an indication there's a problem with the septic? Deal with that in advance if you're the listing agent. No, why, you, why would you put yourself in that situation? Owns, though, you know. Well, you don't know, but, well, but, but again, you can find out whether it's on the, on the septic or not, and then you ask for everything. And, and if you're representing the buyer in that case, yes, I want it to be pumped and I want it to be inspected. Oh, and then by the way, wherever I have room on the contract, and I want the seller to pay for the cost of a fully functional certified septic system. I want the seller to pay for the cost of whatever is required to give me a termite clearance. I want the seller to pay for the cost, and we can, we could go through the rest of these. I'm going to skip through them quickly, but to have the domestic well tested. Again, seller, show, or check the box, to have it tested for water potability, goes back to your real estate exam, potability means I can drink it, and productivity. That means does it have enough flow? Is there enough water flowing in the well to number one, drink it, it's potable, and number two, you know, it takes 10 days to fill up a cup of water. Okay, not enough, not enough productivity, no water flowing through. Okay, it does not, all it says is pay for the test. Now you've paid for the test. Oh, yeah, you can't drink the water. Water is bad. Oh, there's no flow anyway. Does it say now the seller has to pay to have a new well drilled? No. Put it in the contract. Okay? Get it covered. Okay?
okay? Who's paying for that stuff? Natural hazard zone disclosure. Um, again, traditionally in our market, the seller is paying for the natural hazard zone disclosure. They're anywhere between 50 and 125 bucks. Um, pick a company, they're all generally the same, they're all generally good. You do not want the seller to fill out this on their own. Yes, it's in a fire hazard. No, it's not an earthquake zone. No, 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 no. We don't do that. You certainly don't do that. You never recommend your seller to do it. Pay for the natural zone disclosure. Now, having said that, let's suppose this is a little tougher to fix, okay? Unlike the septic or the disposal or a roof inspection or whatever it happens to be, if the natural hazard zone disclosure comes back and says that the property is in a flood zone, well, you can't, I mean, it's in a flood zone. You can't fix that, okay? So now it's really up to the buyer, well, do I want to buy a property that's in a flood zone? If they do, they're going to move forward. If they don't, then now they're going to pull back. Fire zone, very high fire zone, severe fire zone. Don't ask me the definition of those. There's, they're all defined in that thing. It's enough to make you crazy. But anyway, that's all that they're getting for the report. Now again, now you get a couple of you know, grab bags here. Buyer or seller to pay for the follow inspection. That's your, your pool equipment or your roof inspection. Be specific, okay? If you want a pool inspection, what does that mean? Is there a place you can go that says, this is the Pool Contractors of America 10-point inspection? Okay. I want to know, does the equipment work? Does the filter be specific? Who's going to pay for it? What do you want? Ah, gosh darn it. I thought I was doing better with that. Um, so be very clear with what you're, what you're asking for. If you want that pool inspection, then um, um, be specific. If you want a roof inspection, and what do you want? Oh, what I want a five-year roof certification. What does that mean? The roofer that inspects the roof says, I guarantee this roof will not leak for the next five years. Or a three-year, or a two-year, or a ten-year, whatever you want. Be specific. Who's going to do it, and what do you mean? And again, we can go on and on and on. Government retrofit. There's very, very few of these, and there's, there's well, specifically in Marino Valley where we're teaching this course, um, we do not have any government retrofits except for these this specific federal and state mandated ones, which are the smoke detectors, water heater, and carbon monoxide detectors. Okay, in this particular case, traditionally in our marketplace, the seller pays for those items. They don't have to though. The law just states they have to be there. So if they're not there, and you have a seller who wants to argue, which is kind of silly, I said, no, I'm not gonna. They're getting such a good deal. I don't want to pay for smoke detectors. Okay, well that's fine. The buyer, you can negotiate that, but they need to be there irrespective, regardless of who pays for it. Smoke detector, water heater strapping, um, and of course now we've got the, um, the carbon monoxide stuff. Okay, item B2 talks about the cost of compliance with other minimum mandatory retrofits. Other minim minimum mandatory retrofits are things like, and again, there's not a lot of communities that, um, that have these um, that we're doing business in, but you have to know that. If you're venturing over to a city that you've never done business, and you need to find out, does the city of Linwood require property inspections? Do you have to have a low flow short shower head or a low flush toilet? That's what this is talking about. That's specifically what they're talking about. Does the city or any government agency require something to be done? These are normally referred to as point of sale um, um, triggers, okay? At the point of a sale, the city of X says you have to replace all the shower heads with a low flow shower head. Replace all the toilets with a whatever. You have to get an inspection done. Some cities have inspections. You cannot transfer property without a city inspector coming out and inspecting the property. What are they looking for? Problems. Wow, this is a beautiful room addition. Doesn't appear as though you ever pulled a permit for this. Well, let's start with that. Let's pull a permit first, and then let's see you know, how much it's going to cost to correct or demolish. Okay, so that's where the what basically what the government retrofit is. Okay, now can these things cost you tens of thousands of dollars in excess of your commission? Absolutely, cost you a pile of money. So now let's get to the cost that most buyers and sellers are somewhat expecting to pay anyhow. In our area. Buyers and sellers normally split escrow fees, totally negotiable. This would normally be one of those where you could have both the buyer and the seller box checked simultaneously. So check buyer, check seller to, to pay escrow fees, 50-50. Buyer and seller agree to pay their own escrow fees. 
And escrow fees normally are split just that. They're split 50-50. Sometimes the, the fees will vary a little bit. The escrow may charge the buyer an extra fee for like a loan tie-in to work with the lender. Um, or they, maybe they'll charge the seller an extra fee for maybe a delivery um, fee or a notary fee or something like that. But the actual escrow fees normally are split 50-50. Escrow holder, again, any reliable seller's choice or put in, if you're representing the buyer, put in your choice of, of escrow. Um, you know, if you're, if the only challenge that you have in an offer is who the escrow is going to be, um, remember who you work for. You know, you're working for your client. Don't be blowing deals apart because you want to use First American escrow and they want to use Chicago escrow. That's silly, okay? Now, having said that, if you've had a bad experience with a specific escrow and or title, and it's fresh in your mind, you're like, you know, re relay that to the other agent. They're going to normally, they're normally going to be going to share those opinions with you. But, but remember who you're representing. You're representing your client. So don't, don't, most of your buyers, so they could care less who your escrow company is, who your title company is. So don't, don't get hung up on that. Um, a buyer and seller um, shall pay. Now normally, the seller's box is checked here. Sellers shall pay for owner's title insurance policy specified in paragraph 12E, which we haven't even gotten to yet. Owner's title policy shall be issued by, again, ABC Title Company, First American Chicago, whatever it happens to be. Okay? Tradition, uh, totally negotiable. In Southern California, normally the seller pays for that. Having said that, you need to point out this little thing down here to the buyer. And I don't know why, I wish they would change this. It's, this is, almost looks like it was thrown as an afterthought, okay? Buyer shall pay for any title insurance policy insuring buyer's lender unless otherwise agreed in writing, which is not normally otherwise agreed in writing. So what this is saying is the buyer, if they're getting a loan, which in most cases your buyer is going to be getting a loan, they will have some title insurance fees, okay? Um, you need, this is in one of those areas when you're explaining this contract to your buyer, and especially when you're talking about fees, you might want to take a, just 10 seconds and say, oh, by the way, I know we've asked the seller to pay for the title insurance, but you will see a charge for the lender's portion of the title insurance on your closing statement, and if you've gotten your good faith already from ABC Mortgage, you're going to notice on there. Oh wait, I see they're charging me $600 for title insurance. Your buyer, unless they've read this, is going to think, oh no, no, we took rid of it, we got rid of that. The seller's paying for that. Well, no, they're not. Okay? You need to explain it to them. Is it possible that a buyer will then subsequently come to you at close of escrow with a closing statement, a HUD one, that says, I got charged for title insurance, and it says right here how I wasn't supposed to. And then you've got to point out this. Okay? Point it out to them in advance, because they're going to have some fees there. Okay? Other closing costs. Now again, I do not like check, 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 just check them all just because that's how I do business and I'm lazy and I just want to check every box I possibly can. Okay? Know what you're doing. Know what you're writing. Um, the county transfer fee, it is traditional for the seller in our area to pay for the county transfer tax. Okay? So, Check the box if that's what you want to do. Um, it's also, I suppose, traditional for the seller to pay a city transfer tax or fee, but a lot of cities don't have them, okay? You need to know that. If your city, be a professional. Nothing drives me more crazy than when I see all of these things checked, and it's like, well, they obviously have never sold a house in my city because there is no city transfer fee, okay? If you are venturing out into a city where you haven't done business, be a professional. Find out, okay? Is there a transfer tax? And it's, I don't know that there's anything, you know, completely and totally embarrassing about asking the listing agent. Having said that, I would not trust the listing agent to know if there's a city transfer fee. Find out. If you've never sold a house in the city of Rancho Cucamonga, call them up. Go to their website. You know, find out what it is. And then figure out who's going to pay for it. Same thing with the homeowner's station. God forbid you're writing an offer and you have no idea whether the property is in a homeowner's association or not. Okay? Um, I gotta tell you, I've got some issues going on right now within this office <coughs> on closed transactions where the buyer and or the seller maybe was a bank and did a disclosure, didn't know. Buying properties where there was no um, 
no, no disclosure of a homeowners association. Big, big problem. But there's a couple things in here. Number one, forgetting the fact that is the property actually in a homeowners association? That's kind of important itself. But number two, if it is, who's going to pay for the transfer fee? Normally, mm -hmm. the seller pays for that, but it's negotiable. And who's going to pay for the document preparation fee? Normally, the seller pays for that, but again, it's negotiable. Mm -hmm. If you're the listing agent, probably a pretty good idea to know this stuff in advance. What are the fees? How much? Um, do they seem reasonable? Is there a doc prep fee? Do they require fees in advance? Sometimes in order to get the information from the homeowners association, they want to check in advance. Give them 250 bucks before you can even get that. Well, if the seller is paying for that, get a check from your seller. Maybe at the time you take the listing. Maybe that's a little early. But at the time you get the offer accepted, hey, great, everything's been accepted. Well, by the way, you're agreeing to pay for the HOA transfer fee and the document prep fee. And guess what? Sunnymead Ranch requires it to be paid in advance, and I need a check for 250 bucks. Why don't you get your checkbook out right now? Make that out to Sunnymead Ranch PCA. Okay? Be a professional. Get it done now. Get that check. Get it over to escrow. Have them order those HOA docs immediately. As opposed to what most agents do, you wait till the end, escrow calls, we haven't got the docs, they won't give us the demand, oh, by the way, we need 250 bucks, and we're, you know, five days away from closing. Forget about the fact that we missed all of our disclosure deadlines, okay? And now you're scrambling, your seller's on vacation, you know, blah, 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 blah. Be a pro, get it done in advance. Okay, sellers shall pay for any private transfer fees. We don't normally have those around here, but that would be a, a it is exactly what it is, a private transfer fee. Sometimes there's transfer fees on from home builders, it's crazy stuff like that. Uh, this is kind of the traditional one with the home inspection. Yeah, everybody asks the seller to pay for home inspection. Great, put down a dollar amount, okay? Put down who the buyer wants. What are you gonna cover? I want the air conditioner, I want the pool, I want this, I want that, check it out. Make sure you know what you're getting. Make sure whatever you've asked for, there's enough money to cover it. If you if you said, um, you know, $250 and I want Old Republic and I want to cover the air conditioner and the pool, well, 250 bucks isn't going to buy that. So guess how much does the seller pay for? 250 bucks. Well, who pays for the rest? Well, in theory, the buyer. Okay, but make sure you know. Okay, and then again, now we've also got our kind of our, our pick list. You know, buyer and or seller can pay for. Da 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 da. You know, whatever else it happens to be. Super duper critical. Okay, I tell you, we've been going for two hours solid. Um, at the risk of taking a break and having nobody return, um, we're going to turn the camera off. Um, we're going to take a five minute break max. And I am going to come back and finish this. There you go. I wish there was a light in the front, that, like a red light. Okay, we're recording for sure? Yes. Cool. Okay, all right, we're back. We're at the top of page um, three. Um, so we've gone through page one, which is terms, conditions, basically is normally price and financing. Page two, for the most part, all talks about who's going to pay for what, you know, closing costs, cost allocation, inspections, that sort of stuff. Um, so page three, four, five, six, and seven, and eight are a little bit faster for us to go through, but much less boxes to check and or fill out. As a matter of fact, for the most part, pretty much from here back, a lot of agents never check a box, okay? but you need to know what it says. So, starting with closing and possession, the default, the def and this is very important, I have a current pending um, issue um, over whether a buyer intended to occupy the property or not. Is it going to be their primary residence or are they going to rent this out as an investment property? The default on the property assumes that the buyer is going to occupy the property. That is important for a variety of reasons, okay? Most importantly is for financing. Financing rules are different for owner occupants as opposed to investors. Um, and you certainly don't want to encourage your buyer in any case, but certainly in this case, to lie on their offer in an effort to obtain a certain type of financing. Okay, a matter of fact, just the opposite. If they tell you they do not intend on occupying the property, but they're asking you to wink, wink, nod, nod, we're going to tell the lender you cannot participate in that. Okay, that's fraud, okay, and we don't do that. But at any rate, the, the, the default is that the buyer intends on occupying the property, and if they don't, you check the box. Okay, seller-occupied properties, um, there's, or vacant properties, actually it doesn't really matter. The default is 
If the property is seller occupied or vacant, possession shall be delivered to the buyer at 5 p.m. If you don't check the box, it's 5 p.m. If you do check the box, maybe it's vacant and you might put, you know, I don't know, 8 a.m., I don't know. But the default is 5 p.m., let's assume we don't change it, on the date of close of escrow. Okay? So, if it's vacant, that's pretty easy. Property's vacant, escrow's closed, and at 5 o'clock that day, let's suppose we got recording confirmation at 3 in the afternoon, well, in theory, the buyer needs to wait two hours, then they can go over and occupy the property. Now, if the property is occupied and you don't change anything, the seller has to be out of the property when? If you don't change anything, they have to be out on close of escrow, which is not practical because sometimes escrows don't close on time. And traditionally, we said three days worth of close of escrow to give the seller an opportunity, number one, to confirm that escrow actually closes, and then number two, to get the moving truck and all the rest of that out there. So if you have a seller-occupied property, or for that matter, a tenant-occupied property, you need to make sure that you're giving the current occupant of that property enough time to get out of the property. Okay. This is another reason. This, on vacant properties, it's easy. Property is vacant, you close escrow, bam, you get the keys. Okay. But going back to page one, we were talking specifically about setting a close of escrow date, okay? Whether we say 45 days or whether we say on a specific date. Whether you're the buyer or the seller, you need to keep that in mind. If you're representing, let's suppose you're representing the seller and the agent writes a close of escrow date that happens to be a Tuesday, okay? And let's suppose that the seller has, and we have gone over here and we've said, close of escrow or blah, 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 or on a date, on a certain date, or the traditional, this is what normally happens, check the box, no later than three days after close of escrow, okay? That's the normal one. But let's suppose the buyer and you as their agent have wrote a close of escrow date that is on a Tuesday, okay? Escrow now closes, seller has to be out of the property Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at 5 o'clock. Does that work for all sellers? Not for everybody. They're at work. Oh, geez, now I have to take off work. I got to do this. I can't get any friends to help me, so on and so forth. Which is why, especially on owner occupied properties, you know, we're always looking for that Thursday or Friday closing. Okay? So they can get maybe the Friday off work and move Saturday, Sunday, whatever it happens to be. But these are things for your own peace of mind you want to keep in mind, and again, it's, it doesn't matter what side of the transaction you're representing, think common sense. This is another reason why I like specific close of escrow dates on my page one. I like escrows closing on Fridays. I like that, okay? I don't like escrows closing on Mondays or Tuesdays or Wednesdays. Thursdays I'll take, but if I can control it, Fridays are good. Now, if it's a vacant property, I don't care. Okay? But even think, frankly, even a lot of your buyers probably would prefer a close of escrow that's near the end of the week. Okay? If you close escrow on a Monday, a lot of your buyers can't get access to the property. They're kind of sitting there in limbo. So it's very important that you know exactly what you're dealing with as it relates to who's in the property, can you, and if you're representing the seller, are you giving them enough time to get out of the property? Okay? Um, okay, if the trainer are at the same time, buyer and seller advise. An occupancy agreement. Okay, um, basically this last part is if um, if transfer of title and possession do not occur at the same time, buyer and seller advice to enter a written occupancy agreement. What they're talking about right there is if you have a property that for even if it's three days, if escrow closes today, an occupancy is not going to be delivered at the same time. Three days later, thirty days later, the contract says. We are advising you, agents on the contract, enter into a separate occupancy agreement, which is basically a rental agreement. Okay? Now, we don't normally enter into a rental agreement for three days. That's kind of a given. It's kind of understood. But let's give you the obvious example. What happens 
we closed escrow. Seller's still on the property. I've never had this happen, by the way. <clears throat> um, and three days pass, seller doesn't move. What does the buyer have to do? Well, they have to evict them. Okay? You can, if you call the sheriff up, the sheriff's going to say, this, is, uh, this isn't a criminal action. Okay? It's a civil action. You guys have a contract. You were supposed to get out of the property. You haven't gotten out of the property. Sorry, I can't help you. Okay? Now, I've had it happen where the sellers need an extra day or two, but I've never had the situation where a buyer actually physically had to go through an eviction process to evict, a, to evict a, 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 an owner. Um, but you certainly want to get that covered, certainly want to get that covered if you're dealing with tenants. If you have a tenant in the property, even if the, there is no possession issue, and this talks about tenant, actually, let me come, come to the tenant occupant practice here a minute. There's one other thing I want to cover, and I left this out. Consult with their insurance and legal advisors. There are some insurance considerations, okay? Especially if the tenants, if the owners stay in there long term. Now, normally, if there's a problem that happens, you know, we close escrow on Friday, the seller is going to have three days to move out, and on Saturday night, while the seller's moving out, they show up on Sunday morning, the house is burned down. Okay? Whose insurance covers that? Buyer's insurance. Now, the buyer's insurance will cover to rebuild the house that's burned down, which really stinks because they haven't even had a chance to move into it yet. But they're probably, not probably, it's not going to cover the, the contents, not going to cover the seller's contents. So if the seller lost their TV and the couch and all the rest of that, the seller would better have some coverage. Covered. So there's always those quirky things that keep us up at night. And insurance, you know, consult with your attorney, consult with your insurance agent. Okay, tenant occupied properties. Um, if the buyer plans on occupying a tenant occupied property, the default is the property shall be vacant five days prior to close of escrow. So basically what we're saying is we want to make sure that the buyer, excuse me, that the tenant has vacated the property prior to close of escrow because we don't want to have the situation where we have a new owner of the property fighting over a tenant in order to get them out of the property. And again, if we're unable to deliver the property vacant in accordance with rent control, that's a whole other deal, but you may be in breach of contract of the agreement. And what they're referring to here is the seller, okay? So if the seller says, sure, I'm going to get you out, and forget about whether it's in a rent control, if the seller says, my property is tenant occupied, and I agree by default, the item CI, tenant will be out in five days. If for whatever reason the seller has not made that arrangement with the tenant, and the tenant is giving them a bad time, irrespective of whether it's in rent control, the seller is in breach. Seller is in breach of contract, okay? So normally, I like to put some language in here that in effect kind of gives the seller a little bit of wiggle room. So say the seller will do everything we can within reason to deliver possession five. However, there may be certain things out of our control in the event the seller cannot deliver possession um, within five days prior to our scheduled close of escrow day. Um, you know, buyer, you know, buyer may, may cancel the agreement and no penalty, or seller will not be held, you know, um, you know in, in default in that particular case. Because that's truly, believe me, as a, as a company that does a lot of property management, that's one of those things you can't control. You think that you've got an agreement with the tenant, you think that that tenant is the nicest, been the best tenant ever, but now when it comes time to relocating them, all bets are off. So very, very dangerous language, the default language, very, very dangerous, especially if you want that tenant to vacate, okay? Now, if you want the tenant to remain in possession, which that's kind of nice, that works, okay? Well, check the box. The buyer is an investor. It already has a tenant there. That's great, okay? So they can remain in possession. Um, but you want to basically make sure, let me see if this is what I'm talking about. No, 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 no. no okay, let me go, let me, I'm still here with the tenant occupied properties. There's certain things that you want to make sure you take care of in that particular case. Condition of the property. <coughs> um, what are we going to do with the security deposit? Okay. Who currently has the security deposit from the tenant, if there is one? There's a, let's suppose there's a $2,000 deposit. Who has that right now? Well, the seller has that. Is there language in, in here that says that the seller is going to credit the buyer the $2,000 deposit from the tenant? You better get that covered. Let's suppose you close escrow in the middle of the month. The tenant paid rent for the entire month. They, they, pay, they have $1,500 a month rent. 
It's December 1st. They pay the entire month's rent to the seller. It's now December 15th. Escrow closes. Who, well, who's entitled to the remainder of the rent for the month of December? The buyer, the new owner. Where are they going to get that money from? Well, you need to get that in your escrow instructions. If the buyer assumes the property with the tenant to remain in possession, the seller, through close of escrow, will credit the buyer with X amount of dollars that represents the buyer's security deposit and X amount of dollars for prorated rent for however many days remain in the end, until the end of the month. Okay? You want to cover that. Especially, <clears throat> let's just suppose you're representing the buyer in that transaction. You failed to cover those items. Escrow is now closed. Now the buyer, maybe they're not as sophisticated. They realize that they are you know, missing. Um, and let's suppose it's a little different. Let's suppose you close escrow on the third of the month. The tenant paid the rent on the first. Who'd they pay it to? The owner who no longer owns the house anymore. They only own it for three days. The remaining 27 days of the month should be the buyer. The buyer now realizes, well, hey, where's my December rent? Well, the seller's got it. Well, give it to me. No, I'm not going to give it to you. Why? It's not in the contract. Oh, by the way, what about the deposit? Where is that? I'm like, no, I'm not going to give it to you. Why? Because it's not in the contract. Get it in the contract. And also, of course, make sure that your, your buyers get a copy of the, of the rental agreement. Okay. At close of escrow, seller assigns to buyer any unassignable warranty rights items included in the sale. Seller shall deliver available copies of warranties. Broker cannot and will not determine assignability of warranties. What are we talking about here? Warranties for dishwashers and pool equipment and roofs and stuff like that. If they're available and assignable, great. If not, we're sorry. At close of escrow, unless otherwise agreed in writing, seller shall provide keys. Okay? It sounds like common sense, but make sure you understand what you're agreeing to. You know, can the seller provide keys to everything in the, on the property? The lock on the shed, this, to that. If they can't, they better make sure they got it covered. Um, and also, garage door openers, security alarms, you know. Um, on the transfer disclosure statement, there's something in there that says the seller will provide X amount of clickers to the garage door. You know how many garage door clickers I've had to purchase? A bunch. Well, you said you were going to give them two, but you only gave them one. Okay, well, let's get that covered. Homeowners Association keys, all of that sort of stuff. Very, very important. And these are the little type of things that will nickel and dime you to death um, as, as, a, as an agent representing the buyer or the seller. This costs you tons and tons of money. Statutory disclosures. <clears throat> these, are the, these are the ones you're all read statutory, statutory, required by law, okay? Including lead-based paint and that, 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 cancellation rights. In effect, we've got them all listed here. And this is, in effect, saying, seller shall, within the specified time in paragraph 14. This is the third or fourth time that the contractors referred to paragraph 14. We're only on paragraph 6. Paragraph 14 is kind of important, okay? So when paragraph 14 is being referred to, this is at least the third or fourth time. So it's saying, seller shall, within the time par specified in paragraph 14a, deliver to the buyer, if required by law, the following disclosures. Federal lead-based paint and the pamphlet. Disclosures required by sections 1102 and 1103 of the Civil Code, statutory disclosures. Statutory disclosures include but are not limited to real estate transfer disclosure statement, okay? The TDS, gotta give them that. So we've got the lead-based paint, we've got the transfer disclosure, natural hazard disclosure, the NHD, gotta have statutory, okay? Um, what else have we got in here? Real estate transfer, natural hazard disclosure, um, notice or actual knowledge of illegal or controlled substance. Now, there's not necessarily a specific disclosure there, but let's suppose the seller or you as the listing agent or the buyer's agent have knowledge that there's been um, oil that's been disposed of in the back of the property, or the property was used as a meth lab you know, two weeks ago and it's being cleaned up, okay? Well, you've got to disclose those sort of things, okay? Homeowners associations, Nello Roos, I could go on for hours about Nello Roos, improvement bonds, all that sort of stuff. And if the seller has actual knowledge, um, industrial use, military ordinance, okay? I used to, that's not like a military ordinance as in a city ordinance. This has to do with bombs, okay? Are you selling a property that's maybe close to March Air Force Base? Are they storing 
bombs on March Air Force Base. How many miles is that from the property? People get, get scared of stuff like that, okay? So if we have, now do we know what they're storing over at March Air Force Base? I have no idea, okay? Um, and again, by the way, is that something that's in the Natural Hazard Disclosure Statement? It actually is in the NHD. There will be some things in there, but let's suppose we have a house that's literally right at the fence line for the Air Force Base. You might want to pay a little closer attention to that, okay? Um, so anyway, we've got the statutory disclosures. Then we have the buyer that says the buyer shall, first of all, the seller shall, and this was the seller shall deliver by the specified time in paragraph 14. I have to give the buyer all of these things, okay? The buyer has a responsibility as well, also within the specified time in paragraph 14. They need to basically return signed copies of the disclosures. Sign, return them back, okay? Now, in the event that the seller, in the event seller prior to close of escrow becomes aware of new conditions, now something else has come up. I gave you a transfer disclosure statement when we opened escrow within the specified time in paragraph 14. Now, two days before close of escrow, and I told you the roof was fine, two days before close of escrow, we had a really, really bad rain and wind, and I noticed just a small little drop of water in the bathroom, but it was really small. And you know what? It doesn't look like it's going to rain again for another month. Well, the seller has direct knowledge that something's changed. Okay? They have to disclose that. Especially, uh, like now we had uh, the wind, the uh, sand, yep. the winds that shifts the absolutely. clouds. Absolutely. You know. Oh, absolutely. All of that sort of stuff. If that, if they become aware of anything that's changed materially. Again, like it has to be material. We're not talking about a little scratch in the wall or a little nick in a piece of tile or something like that. We're not really talking cosmetic changes, okay? But we are talking anything that materially would impact a buyer's decision on whether they want to move forward needs to be disclosed, okay? Um, okay, so we've got the, um, and again, the seller comes up with any additional information. They need to basically disclose that. If any of the disclosures or notices specified in paragraph 6A, which are these, or the subsequent disclosures, which could come from here, okay? Um, blah, 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 blah. After the sign by seller, buyer shall have the right to cancel this agreement with three days and delivery. Okay, this is in person or if it's, you know, wait, hold on a second. If any disclosures and notice above are subsequent amended disclosures is delivered to buyer after the offer is signed, buyer shall have the right to cancel this agreement within three days after delivery in person or five days after delivery by depositing the mail. Um, given notice to the right of cancellation of seller or seller's agreement. Okay, basically what this is saying is the buyer sees something, doesn't like it. Okay? You have now disclosed to me that the property is built on a landfill. Okay? If you've disclosed it to me in person, here's the documents in person, I've got three days to cancel. If you've mailed it to me, I've got five days from the, from the delivery to cancel. Okay? And then also, a note to buyer and seller, Waiver of statutory and lead-based disclosures is prohibited. So if you have a buyer and a seller that's, ah, forget it, it's, it's cool, as is, what you see is what you get, caveat in here, you know, um, they, they can't waive it. they got to do it anyway, okay? Now, they can get the disclosures, and they can see, yes, it's on a landfill, and, it's, and there's bombs buried on the property, and there's all sorts of, at that point, then the buyer can sit back, oh, that's cool, I'm fine with that, okay? But you can, they cannot waive the right to their statutory disclosures. Okay? Okay, natural um, and environmental hazards within the time specified again in paragraph 14. We're going to get to that in a minute. Um, so it's required by law to deliver earthquake. This is the earthquake booklet. Okay? Yes. Natural hazards. Now, this is not the natural hazard disclosure statement per se. This is the booklet that says this is kind of what you do in an earthquake and, you know, all the rest of that sort of stuff. Um, and it talks about mold and asbestos and all the rest of this. We need to give that booklet to the, um, to the purchaser. Okay? Normally it's done as part of the natural hazard disclosure, but don't be confused. The natural hazard disclosure statement is the one page statement form. The booklet is what we're referring to here. Okay? And again, that talks about it. It gives all these wonderful definitions for the, what I was joking about earlier. The special flood zone the potential flood zone, a very high fire hazard zone, 
a state buyer. I mean, you got all these, these crazy different zones, okay? So buyer seller needs to be able to provide that, and this is a reason for the um, for the buyer to withdraw from a transaction if they're not comfortable with that, okay? Um, withholding taxes within the time specified in paragraph 14a to avoid required withholding seller shall deliver to buyer or qualified substitute an affidavit sufficient to comply with the federal FERPTA okay and a California withholding law okay this is important okay this is basically the FERPTA form that the seller provides to the buyer if the seller does not provide this to the buyer in theory and in fact, the buyer could be responsible to pay withholding taxes for the seller. This is normally handled through escrow, but it's our responsibility <coughs> as agents to make sure that's done. The Megan's Law Database. Megan's Law Database is pretty straightforward. Um, it basically um, is the database that has the registered sex offenders within certain um, neighborhoods, not certain neighborhoods, with all neighborhoods, at least in our marketplace. Um, and the Megan's Law Disclosure um, when you're when you're basically representing a buyer and or seller, the, the traditional recommendation on the Megan's Law database is to refer your client to the database. Okay, so in other words, if you have a buyer that is concerned about are there registered sex offenders in the neighborhood, then you refer them to the Megan's Law database, and then they can determine whether or not there is anybody that's a registered sex offender within a certain you know geographic location from the property that they have in question. Now, uh, well, there's a phone number to call as well. I mean, the, um, if you do a Google search on Megan's Law, I think it's, you know, meganslaw.gov or .org or something like that. It's actually on there, Megan's Law. Oh, is it on the actual form? Yeah. Okay. Is it in this paragraph? Yes, it's in B, right there. Off to the right, second line. Uh, as soon as this thing stops moving yeah. here, we'll be able to find it. Ah, there it is. Yep, meganslaw.ca.gov. And I'm assuming there's a probably a meganslaw.nv for nevada.gov or whatever it happens to be. Now, this is the deal. Um, to be honest with you, the, the registered sex offender database, it's not quite as big a deal maybe as it used to be five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. If for no other reason, the sad truth is you do a search on pretty much any geographic area and it used to shock me, now it's, it doesn't shock me at all. There are registered sex offenders all over the place, okay? My experience has been most buyers have become a little bit numb to that. Having said that, many buyers may be perfectly comfortable to have a registered sex offender a quarter mile away, three blocks away. They may not. Now, they might have a heck of a hard time buying a house in our specific location and neighborhood because they are literally that close. But they certainly could have a problem if it's immediately across the street, right next door. That is not for us to, that is not our decision to make. We refer them to the database and we basically let them make that call. And they certainly can cancel if they feel that they're um, basically too close to a um, registered sex offender. Now, Two, two words of caution on this. If your seller has knowledge, which most of them will, if you're in that situation where you have a house that you're listing and the seller knows there is a registered sex offender immediately across the street, oh, and by the way, that's why we're moving, um, you're on notice. You and the seller are required to disclose the location and the proximity of that registered sex offender to the buyer. Um, for this reason, Traditionally, the brokers, as a, as a matter of fact, it even says, neither seller nor brokers are required to check this website. Okay? For that reason, it kind of sounds a little bit of like we're avoiding, the, avoiding what's the obvious, but it's not normally recommended practice that we check the website. Okay? Now, if you have a buyer and you're showing the buyer around and they tell you three times before you even get to out the driveway that boy, I've had a bad experience, I certainly want to make sure that there's no registered sex offenders within, you know, 100 miles of where I'm buying. Well, in that particular case, when you start showing them properties, you might want to do a little more due diligence in that particular case and make sure you want to. Having said that, even if you do it, you make sure the buyer does it themselves. Very, very important. Okay, condominium planned uh, unit developments. Um, this is your traditional homeowners association, okay? Seller has seven days is the default, or longer if you need more time or less, 
to disclose to buyer whether the property is a condominium or it's located in a planned development or other common interest subdivision. Okay? Is the property in a homeowners association? They have seven days to disclose that information. If the property is in a condominium or is located in planned development, which by the way, normally I, they must have changed this. This used to say planned unit development. You'll hear yeah. language like PUD a lot, P-U-D, PUD. P -U -D. Yeah. Um, um, so I, it looks like they must have changed it since the last time I taught this. But if it's in a PUD, planned unit development, um, again, basically with or common interest subdivision, um, all they're, they're talking about homeowners associations. The seller has three days uh, after acceptance to request the form. Now, you don't necessarily have to use the HOA form, but what this is referring to is the seller has to get all of the documentation to the buyer on the homeowner association. The bylaws, the CC&Rs, the minutes, the budget, the, the um, 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 reserve study. There's just tons and tons and tons of stuff um, that normally the seller may have, but it's in a drawer and they haven't looked at it since they bought the house. So normally you want to get this information, which is why it says you need to order it from, the seller has three days um, after acceptance to request from the homeowners association, because sometimes it might take them two or three weeks to get it to you, which is why if you're the listing agent, it's a good idea, get this information in advance. If you take the listing today, prepare the seller to get this stuff, okay? And I don't just mean the bylaws and the CCNRs. You're supposed to provide 12 months of minutes, regular meetings and special meetings, contact information, governing documents, the whole nine yards. But if the seller uh, no longer has that information, then you get it from the management the company. Well. Then you get it from the management company. And they have to do it. They've got to do it, otherwise they're in breach. Got, got to do it. Okay? And again, there is a, there, there, there's a little bit of a challenge here. I wish that this form would change a little bit. I wish there would be a line in here above this that basically says the property is or is not located in a homeowners association. Okay, um, I don't know why they don't do that. There are more transactions because we do homeowners association management. I mean, more than I, I could ever believe where buyers are, are closing escrows on transactions, especially a lot of the foreclosure transactions, and they don't even know the property's in an HOA. Okay, and it's working its way through escrow and titles clearing it and all the rest of that sort of stuff. Um, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't give you that option. And it's a, it, it can be a problem if you're not aware. It just says, if the seller has, okay, well, what if, the, what if the bank doesn't know? Now, should they know? Yeah. Should escrow and title ultimately figure it out? Yeah. Should the listing agent figure it out? Yeah. Okay? But at any rate, that's a problem. So be aware. And again, it gets back to know what you're selling. Know the location and where you're at when you're selling these properties. Okay. Um, items included and excluded. All right, I've got a million stories about what's included and what's excluded into a property. Well, I'm looking for this page to pull up here a little bit. Um, basically, this is another one of those areas which will cost you money, whether you are representing buyers or whether you are representing sellers. You need to have this conversation with both of those clients. If you are the listing agent, you, when you take that listing, stop, please, when you... Last one? Last one. Oh, don't go any further. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you're the listing agent, you want to sit down and you want to ask your seller, hopefully this is going to stop in a minute. You're going to ask your seller, stop. <laughs> you're going to make me, ah, of course, I've gone too far. One, two, all right. You want to ask your seller specifically, what are you including and what are you excluding from the sale of your property? Okay. Basic things. Um, are you going to take the curtains? Curtains are fixtures. They are attached to the property. Fixtures stay. Do sellers take curtains from the master bedroom because they match the bedspread? Yes. Okay. So you need to have that conversation with the seller. Oh, are you taking? The, what are you including in the sale? And you need to point those things out. I see that your curtains and balances match your bedspread. Do you plan on taking those with you? Most sellers will laugh at that answer and say, well, of course not. I'm not going to take them. They're fixed to the wall. They're 20 years old anyway, and I need a new bedspread anyway. Okay? 
Others, you don't ask the question, and guess what happens in close of escrow? They take them. The buyer comes in and says, where's my curtains? It's going to cost me $3,000 to replace those curtains. I want them back. They are a fixture. They are included in the sale of the property. Okay? Same thing with what's excluded. Um, the ceiling fan. Okay? Ceiling fan in the dining room. It's beautiful ceiling fan. Buyer moves in. It's gone. Okay? Buyer wants the ceiling fan. Well, the seller, I mean, you can't have that ceiling fan. That ceiling fan was Grandma Edna's ceiling fan. It's been in the family for 100 years, so on and so forth. Well, guess what? Grandma's Edna's ceiling fan's coming back, or the buyer has to be compensated for that. Same thing also applies with sellers that they switch it out. Well, that's fine. I'll switch it out for a different ceiling fan. Could be a problem. The one you replaced is inferior to the one you took out. Buyers want to get compensated for that. So make sure that your buyers and sellers both are aware of what's included and what's excluded. The, the things that tend to really um, cause, have caused problems for me are things like pool equipment. Okay? The seller has a really cool um, creepy crawler that cleans the pool. And they're moving to another property that needs has a pool. And this is a $1,500 cleaning thing. Seller takes it with them. Buyer moves in. Hey. Where's my creepy crawler that was cleaning the pool? It's attached. Okay, well, let's get into a debate. Is that personal property or is that a fixture? You don't want to have that debate. Deal with it in advance. You're selling a property with a pool. Make sure it's, it's taken care of. You're selling a property that has maybe horse corrals, okay? Horse people do crazy things, okay? They have horse corrals, all of a sudden the buyer goes in, all the corrals are gone. You know, the seller said, well, of course I took the corrals. We're moving down the block to another horse property. I need the corrals. Those are fixtures. Okay? Deal with that. Okay. Excluded or excluded, very, very important. And again, the obvious stuff needs to stay. Put it in writing if you're going to take care of it. Um, and again, seller represents that all items included in the purchase price. All items are included in the purchase price unless otherwise specified um, and are owned by the seller. Um, items included shall be transferred free of liens, okay? You can't transfer something, and, hey, it's a fixture, but hey, I had, I've been, I've been paying, making payments on my ceiling fan. It's kind of silly, okay? Well, don't let that ceiling fan have a lien on it. That's not, that's not good. Again, an item excluded, this is the obvious one, okay? Um, and again, it looks like this has been modified a little bit. You know, audio and video components. That's kind of a big deal now. People are building televisions into the wall, okay? And again, they even put it on there, such as flat screen TV and speakers. Okay, are you going to take those? Okay, it used to be that a television, that's easy, that's personal property. It's sitting on a stand and it's plugged into the wall. Anymore, televisions aren't like that anymore. Most people have flat screen TVs that are bolted to the wall. That makes them what? Fixtures, okay? So this is kind of specifically dealing just with the audio video equipment um, and it says that they're excluded but there's who knows we're in a whole new world a whole new world of this sort of stuff just make sure your buyers and sellers understand okay of course initials on the bottom of page um bottom of page three okay going to the top of page four we'll back up here a little bit um, and again we're moving we're gonna move a little bit quicker through the rest of these pages um, Bear with me. I'm on terminal server. That's why it's taken so long for this to, these pages to refresh. Okay. Next time we do this, I'm not going to do this in terminal server mode. It won't take so long. Let me go back here. Okay. While I'm waiting for this to load, we're going to talk about condition of the property. It'll start working its way to the top of the page. Okay. Condition of the property. This is kind of, the, in the old days, for those of you who have been around for a while, <coughs> we had this, the Latin phrase called caveat emptor, which basically said, buyer beware. Okay, property is sold as is. I mean, all sorts of language in there that says, you know, pretty much what you see is what you get, and you're, you're stuck with it. Um, okay, stop. Okay, so here we are, top of page four, um, condition of property. Um, unless otherwise agreed, and we went back on this, we kind of went back to the future, property is sold in its present, which in my world means as is, condition, okay? <coughs> now, that doesn't mean that the seller does not have duties to disclose what they know is wrong. 
they still have duties to disclose what they know is wrong, but they're just telling them basically what you see is what you get. All right? And it's present as is condition as of the date of acceptance. Subject to the buyer's investigation rights. So the buyer has the right to do their inspections. Pool, spa, landscaping, ground, yada, yada, yada. Now it also, oh, but by the way, it also says that the seller has to maintain those items through close of escrow. You have a buyer who buys a property, and let's just keep a simple one. The day they accepted the offer, the grass was green and it looked great. 30 days later, the grass is dead and looks terrible. Well, the seller has a responsibility to maintain those items substantially in the same condition. If they haven't done that, they're responsible for that. And that applies to everything, okay? Uh, again, here's that paragraph 14a, has a right, not, doesn't have the right, has the duty to disclose material facts and defects, okay? Buyer has the right to inspect. Buyer is strongly advised to conduct inspections, okay? Never, ever, ever, ever do you want to advise a buyer, ah, it's a brand new house, no need to do a physical inspection. Or look at that, the pool's brand new, no need to check out the equipment. Oh wow, you can look right from here. Man, that roof looks great. Don't waste your money. If the buyers want to have inspections, let them have inspections. Okay, it is their right, and it's only gonna cause you heartburn and pain if you advise them in any way, shape, or form not to do that. Okay, so we're telling them here, the condition is what you see is what you get. By the way, here's a bunch of disclosures. Now the buyer sits back in paragraph 10, and it says buyer's investigation of properties and matters affecting the property. Buyer's acceptance of the condition and any other matter affecting the property is a contingency of the agreement. Okay? Paragraph 14, once again, so the buyer has that get out of jail free card or more like a get out of contract free card. They can do their inspections and for almost any reason within the period specified in paragraph 14b, they can cancel, you know. I don't like the condition. It's too windy. Okay? It's too windy. Yeah, I didn't realize how windy it was up here. The house is beautiful. What do you mean it's too, it never, well, it's, it was too windy the day I was up here. I don't, I'm being ridiculous. But basically, they have an opportunity to do the inspections um, that they want. Any, pretty much any inspection. Having said that, along those lines, um, I may cover this in paragraph 14 later. Um, I just made a statement which is not correct. They do not have the right to do any inspection they want. Okay? If they want to do an inspection, they have to have the seller's permission and authority to do it. For example, if the um, buyer says, I would like to have the city of ABC come out and inspect the property for anything, all the permits proper, whatever it happens to be. Um, they have the right to ask for that, but they have to ask permission first. They have to ask, get the seller's permission. Now, if in the contract they are on page two, hey, we're going to get a roof inspection and a termite inspection, contract says, and the seller is given permission, termite inspection, roof inspection, that's fine. But if they just decide willy-nilly, no, I want to have the city come out, got to have the seller's permission to do that. Because let's suppose that the city does come out, and the city gives them a list of things that are wrong, and the buyer now backs out. What is the seller now stuck with? The seller is now stuck with a city inspection, which has to be disclosed to any future buyers. So the buyer has to have, you can't just go out and perform any inspection you want um, on the property. Um, however, if the seller denies an inspection, the buyer can cancel. Okay? And by the way, these, buyer, these, expen these um, inspections are done at the buyer's expense, unless stated otherwise. Okay? Um, seller again needs to make the property available. That's pretty straightforward. Um, seller to have the utilities on. Okay? If they're going to do inspections, you've got to have utilities on. That's pretty normal stuff. Buyers to indemnify seller. Um, buyer to indemnify and seller. Buyer in indemnity and seller protection for entry upon property. Buyer shall keep property. Okay. Basically, what they're saying is if the buyer is going to order a whole bunch of inspections, they're indemnifying seller and protecting the seller against these inspectors filing liens on the property. So the buyer calls an inspector out, the buyer doesn't pay the inspector, the inspector therefore comes in and liens. This contract basically is what the seller is going to hold up to the buyer and say, hey sucker, 
but you, you've got to pay this, this um, um, fee. And also, uh, any, anything that results out of an inspection that the buyer basically performs, they need to basically hold responsible, they're going to be responsible for that, okay? Um, seller's disclosures, we try to bring this up, again, I apologize for the delay. Um, this is the boilerplate, we'll bring it up here a little bit, of seller disclosures, addenda, advisories, and other items. What are you going to ask the seller to provide to the buyer as it relates to additional disclosures? Are you going to ask for these? If you don't check the box, you're not asking for them. Okay? Um, there's a couple that are checked for you. Um, again, I apologize. My computer is moving slowly. But seller disclosures, seller disclosures, if checked, okay, <laughs> seller shall within the time frame specified where? Paragraph 14, okay, um, complete and provide the following. Seller property questionnaire. A lot of agents are checking that automatically. It's not required, okay? It's not a statutory disclosure. It's a good disclosure, but it's not required. Supplemental contract and statutory disclosure, not required, okay? Oh, by the way, it says this one or this one, okay? Don't check both. They, most of it, a lot of the same information on these. They're very, very um, 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 repetitive. Addendum, if checked, is there an addendum? Maybe you filled out your own. Maybe you wrote a whole bunch of stuff in your offer representing the buyer. You, there was no place to fit it on here. So you wrote an addendum A. You put a whole bunch of terms and conditions. If you wrote addendum A, then you need to check addendum A is now incorporated in to my, into my offer, okay? Wood destroying pests, we talked about that earlier. You asked for a termite inspection, but you failed to say who's going to pay for any corrective repairs. That goes on the wood destroying pest inspection, that's the WPA form. If you ask for the inspection, but you don't check the box, who's paying for the termite work? Probably you, okay? It's probably not the seller, okay? Um, purchase agreement addendum. Have you, do you have a purchase agreement addendum? The septic well and property, um, property monument addendum. What's the property monument addendum? I don't know what the property monument addendum is. It sounds to me like it's probably a, maybe a large acre or parcel, and where, is the, where are the monuments at? Where's the corner of the property? I don't know the answer to that one. Someone needs to check that out. I have no idea but, what that is. I gotta tell you, if you check this box, you better find out. Okay. I probably should know. So, at any rate, short sale addendum. Are we using a lot of these? Absolutely. If you are a listing agent and you are doing a short sale and the buyer's agent does not check the short sale addendum, are you gonna want to counter that into the property or into the counter contract? Absolutely. You're gonna write it, maybe everything is perfect. You're gonna write a counter offer, counter offer one. Two, offer dated, whatever today's date is, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, Mr. and Mrs. Seller. Seller agrees to all terms with the following changes. Short sale addendum is hereby incorporated into um, the real estate purchase agreement contract. Buyer and seller agree to sign an initial short sale addendum. Pretty important. Okay? Advisories, if checked. This one's checked by default. This is it's always silly. How many pages is the, is the contract? Con purchase contract is eight pages. When you print it out, how many pages do you get? 10 pages, because the last two pages of the contract are the buyer's inspection advisory. It's built into the form. I still, for the life of me, don't know why they do it that way, but that's how they do it. Here's the property in probate. Is there a trust? Statewide buyers and sellers advisory. REO advisory. Is the property a foreclosure? It's a good form. If you're, if you're writing a contract um, that's, that's an REO, why not? Get the REO advisory signed, okay? So no one, or if you've got room for others, okay? Make sure you know what you're selling. In most cases, you're at least going to have the WPA form included, the wood destroying pest form. Okay? I, in all cases, if you're doing a short sale, that's a given. Okay? Um, we do not require the seller property questionnaire, but it's good. It's a good idea. Nothing, nothing wrong to ask for that. It, it's definitely a good form. Okay, let me jump up here, and I'm going to go up a couple. Okay. Okay, we're near the bottom of page four. Um, kind of. 
Okay, title investing. Okay, very important. With the, oh, by the way, are you getting bored with paragraph 14? Mm -hmm. Title investing. Mm -hmm. Within the time specified in paragraph 14, buyer shall be provided a current preliminary title report. We do a class on preliminary title reports. If you think this class is bored or boring and dry, <laughs> Wait until you see the preliminary title report class. But yeah, I mean, I, I'll be the first one. I apologize for those of you that have made it through hour three. Yes, we're on hour three. This is not the most exciting stuff in the world. This is the part that, quite honestly, this is, in my opinion, this is what's partially going to separate the great agents from the not so great agents. You need to know this stuff cold. And most agents don't know it cold because it's dry and it's boring and it's scary and I sound like an attorney and all the rest of that sort of stuff. You need to know this because this is what's going to happen. You don't know something on these eight pages and you've been doing great. You've sold your first dozen or so transactions. You think you're a professional. You now run into a client. Your client does what? Actually reads the contract, asks you a question, and you have no idea what they're talking about. Now, there are certain parts of the contract that you could probably get away with, and you could say, you know what, that is so, you know, the, the what was that one I didn't know? The monument addendum. Oh, geez, you know, I guess I should know that. I've been doing this for 25 years. Your buyer may or give you a pass on that. Then again, they may not. I may have just lost total confidence of my buyer and everybody watching this training video because I'm drawing a blank on the monument again. You don't want that to be the case, ever. You never want that to be the case. You want to be able to just spill the stuff off of your tongue as if you wrote the contract yourself. So, at any rate, moving right along. Title investing. Within the time frame, paragraph 14, give them a preliminary title report. You've got to give them a preliminary that's going to disclose to them all of the particulars on the property. You know, are there, are there um, you know, setbacks from the city or, um, um, or are there liens from um, you know, utility easements or whatever it happens to be. All of that stuff is going to be on there. You know, taxes of record. What, what are they looking at if they close escrow on this property? Now, the good news is on a prelim, right, the title company takes most of the risk away from us. Okay? Title company is going to sit back and say, hey, we're going to make sure the buyer's not assuming any, any unnecessary liens or, or liens against the property that's going to affect title. They're not going to let it close without it. But I'll give you a great example. Uh, we'll go back to the homeowners association. Okay? I mentioned earlier you have buyers that are closing escrows on properties. Maybe they're REOs, maybe they're not. Where they didn't know that the property was in a homeowners association. And it's not always perfectly clear. And it doesn't say, for example, on the prelim. X, this property is located in a homeowners association. But it will, what it will always say is there's a set of CCNRs recorded against this property. Okay? You now take a look at those set of CCNRs, and within those CCNRs, you get a copy of the CCNRs. Oh, and the CCNRs basically say the ABC Homeowners Association has adopted these CCNRs on September 15th of 1975. Well, that's a pretty good indication the property is in a homeowners association. So anyway, bottom line is, the prelim is critical. They need to be read, just like the contract needs to be read, the escrow instructions need to be read, and the preliminary title report needs to be read. If for no other reason you want to read the prelims, because even though most of the items that pop up on the prelim will be taken care of through escrow or through the title company, you want to be aware of what they are, you know, specifically if you're representing the seller. Maybe the seller failed to mention to you that there was a second trustee on the property. It was a private second. Now you realize that there's a private second trustee on the property that needs to be addressed. Well, guess what? Sometimes that's not easy to take care of. You read it, you call yourself, hey, what is this? I see a $10,000 second by, by John Jones. Oh, yeah, that's my ex-brother-in-law. Okay, well, he has a lien on your property for ten grand. Oh, I thought we took care of that 10 years ago. I'm pretty sure we paid him off. As a matter of fact, I know we paid him off. Okay, well, guess what? He never reconveyed the um, $10,000. Is that a problem? It could be. Is he available? No, he died. Or he's in prison, or he, I haven't seen him in 15 years. Uh, by the way, those are real stories. 
So read the preliminary title report. It's very, very important that you understand that. Um, okay, sale of buyer's property. In this particular marketplace we're in right now, we're right, you should probably not be writing any offers subject to the sale of the buyer's current property. That is the default. The default is this agreement is not contingent upon the sale of any property owned by the buyer. In different marketplaces, <laughs> sure, you know, we write offers subject to the sale of buyer's properties all the time. I caution you in doing that. In this market, it's probably the kiss of death on any offer that you're going to write. But in any marketplace, I would caution against that. Um, but if you do, if it has to be that way, your buyer will not close escrow on property B until they sell property A, then make sure you check the box. Otherwise, you're committing them to do just that. Oh, my Lord, paragraph 14. We finally got to paragraph 14. Mm -hmm. Okay, it must be the most single most important paragraph in the entire contract, and it's pretty straightforward, okay? It basically says, paragraph A, by the way, time periods, removal of contingencies, and cancellation rights. So it does exactly what it says. How much time do I have? Does it remove contingencies? What do I got to do to remove contingencies? And what rights do I have, if any, to cancel? A, unless it's changed, the seller has seven days after acceptance to deliver all of the things we talked about, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places that it was mentioned earlier in the contract. Um, actually, nine, there's a couple, oh yeah, nine places it was mentioned earlier in the contract that the seller referred to paragraph 14 and they have seven days to deliver that stuff. If the seller cannot deliver that stuff within seven days, you need to check the box and extend it out. I cannot give them my homeowners association documents within that time. I need 14 days. Put it over here. Okay? Paragraph B, quite a bit more involved here. Okay? Um, buyer has 17 days from acceptance um, or after acceptance, unless otherwise agreed, to complete all of their inspections. Okay? Approve the disclosures and the reports and any information which the buyer receives from the seller. Okay? And deliver those signed copies of the statutory disclosures, lead based paint, yada, 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 to the seller in compliance with paragraph 6A. Pretty straightforward. Within the same time specified above, which is also 17 days, the buyer may request the seller make repairs. So within that same 17-day window, they sign everything off, and they say, oh, but by the way, our investigation uncovered something. I would like to request repairs, okay? And they can use the request for repair form, the CAR form RR, request for repairs. But, putting everybody on notice, sellers under no obligation to agree or respond. I love that. That's what I don't know. I don't know who put that in there. Not only does the seller not have to agree, they can ignore the buyer's request. Okay? That seems a little unprofessional. I mean, you should say, yes, I'm going to do it, or no, I'm not. But they don't have to agree to do it, nor do they even have to respond. Okay? Um, but again, that comes with the cost. Okay? Within the same paragraph in 14b1, or as otherwise specified, buyer shall deliver to the seller either a removal of the applicable contingency form or a cancellation. I love this, okay? What this is saying to the buyer, the buyer basically says, I'm either going to remove the contingencies or I'm going to cancel, okay? We do this all day long on our escrows. The buyers, for example, say, let's go back up here, it says that the buyer may request the seller make repairs, okay? We'll go back to them, and we do respond. And sometimes our response, well, a lot of times they say request for repairs. It's completely reasonable, and we say, okay, great, let's, let's get these things done, and we, and we get the repairs done. But let's suppose the request is not reasonable, or, we, or the seller is just basically flat out denied. We ask the seller, or the buyer, rather, give us the request and give us the cancellation. So in other words, if you don't get your request, 
tell us how serious you are. Are you going to cancel? Okay, so in other words, fix the roof or I'm canceling, as opposed to fix the roof. Well, what if we don't? Well, we'll deal with that later. Well, no, are, are, you, are you saying fix the roof or I'm going to cancel? Give me one or the other. So it kind of addresses, it's in a little different context over here, but it's, it's basically telling the buyer that um, they can basically, you know, request and or cancel. And I lost my, my place in here. Oh, the removal of contingency. Remove the contingency or cancellation of this agreement based upon the contingency. Okay? And again, the seller could fail. To, there's a whole bunch of things contained in here. But the bottom line is, this, there's a lot of good stuff in here as it relates to why your contracts are, are going awry, okay? And for the most part, it's fairly simple. Seller deliver within a specified period of time, buyer inspect within a specified period of time, and say I'm either happy or I'm not, okay? And this is so important. Let's suppose our buyer has all the right reasons to cancel a transaction, okay? But we missed our deadline. Okay? You do not want to be the one responsible for the buyer missing their deadline. Because whether the contingencies were properly removed or whether the contingency form um, was signed and the cancellation form was signed, you're always going to get into a dispute between a buyer and seller. Sometimes your client's going to be in the right, sometimes they're going to be in the wrong. Okay? But don't have the dispute be because of the time lapse. Okay? Keep, and, and, and to be honest with you, most agents miss these deadlines all the time. Seller's agents miss the seven days all the time. Buyer's agents miss the 17 days all the time. And it's not just for inspections, appraisal contingencies, loan contingencies. These things are just looked at like no big deal. Okay? And then it becomes a problem, and then it's, you know, it's, it's a big deal when you end up in, in court. Okay? Really, really a, a big problem. So stick with the deadlines and you'll be fine. Um, continuation of contingency. This is important. Paragraph B4. Even after the end of the time frame specified in 14B-1, and before seller cancels the agreement, if at all, pursuant to paragraph 14C, buyer retains the right to either, in writing, remove the contingencies, or cancel the agreement based upon the remaining contingency, or seller's failure to deliver. Once buyer's written removal of all contingencies is delivered, seller may not cancel this agreement. Okay? So that last sentence is important. Sometimes the sellers want to cancel. Okay? And the buyer says, well, oh, that's fine. I'm cool with it. Once buyer's removal of all contingencies is delivered, kind of this kind of gets back to my, my example earlier with, with um, Shirley. Okay? You'll have sellers that are looking to cancel. Maybe this is one of the reasons. If you're representing the buyer, make sure you get in your form that says, hey, all our contingencies are satisfied. I know we were talking about we weren't happy about the termite inspection, but now we are, and I've done it within the proper time frame. I'm cool with that, okay? I'm perfectly fine. Very important, and quite honestly, it's a lot of agents who have been in this business for a long time, this thing gets lost, this, this whole paragraph 14 gets lost, on, ah, the seven days, the 14 days, what does it mean? You know what, take the time and read it, okay? Take the time and read through it. Okay, seller's right to cancel. Seller has the right to cancel. Buyer's contingencies, and again, within the time frame specified, the buyer has not done what they need to do, has not removed the contingencies. Let's take the loan contingency. That's the easiest one. Seller can cancel, okay? Um, um, seller's right to cancel. Buyer contract obligations. Again, same thing. All of this has to do with are they contraction? Part, of it, part has to do with disclosures. The other part has to do with contracts, okay? Um, there's a right to perform. I'll bring it up to the top of the screen here. This is a great form. We need to get in a habit of using it. And I think it should pop up here in one second. Okay. And what we're looking for is notice a buyer to perform. The NBP form, okay? If you are a listing agent and the seller and the buyer is not performing, they're not delivering the inspections, they're not removing the contingencies, they're not doing whatever they need to do, use the notice to buyer to perform. It's got to be in writing. It's a form. It's a CAR form. Be signed by the seller. In this case, by default, you give the buyer at least two days after delivery 
to take the appropriate action, whatever it may be. Remove your appraisal contingency. Remove your loan contingency, whatever it happens to be. Again, very seldom used. We have these great tools to enforce our contracts, and a lot of our agents just don't use it. Okay, <coughs> effective buyer's removal of contingency. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a pretty straightforward thing. If the buyer removes in writing any contingency or cancellation right, unless otherwise specified in a separate written agreement, the buyer with regard to that contingency shall so cancel conclusively deemed to have completed an investigation, so on and so forth. So in other words, they've said I've done my inspection, I've got my loan approval, I've got my termite inspection, I've done this, and I'm removing my contingency. I'm now waiving my right to cancel because the septic's messed up or because the appraisal came in low. Okay? Um, Close of escrow, um, before seller and buyer may cancel this agreement for failure of either party to close escrow pursuant to this agreement, seller and buyer must first give the other a demand to close escrow. So in other words, if you're going to cancel, you need to first give them the demand. I demand you close escrow on so on and so forth. Before buyer or seller may cancel this agreement for failure of the other party to close escrow, forget about the contingencies. All the contingencies are waived. You now get to the close of escrow date. It's a cash deal. For whatever reason, the buyer says, oh, I'm not ready, I need more time. The seller says, don't record yet. Me and my wife are working something out. We were getting a divorce, maybe now we're not. What? By the way, the, the, a lot of these, when we look at these, these contingencies in the contract, a lot of times we think about the buyer. Your sellers can go just as crazy as the buyers. Most escrows fail because buyers inability to perform. I have had plenty of escrows fail because, completely because the seller went crazy, okay? They changed their mind, okay? <clears throat> so this would be one of those cases. Um, before seller or buyer may cancel, okay, in this, my, my example here, the buyer says, hey, wait a minute, I'm ready to rock and roll, you're holding things up, I demand, I demand you close escrow. And if the seller doesn't, again, it's just one more file that ends up in front of the attorneys um, when, you, when you go litigate the darn thing. And again, effect, effective cancellation on deposits. Bottom line, effective cancellation on deposits is depends on who is canceling and what is the reason and who can basically be found in breach. Okay? And then we're going to talk about the deposits at more at length when we get to the liquidated damages clause in a minute. Okay, repairs. Repairs shall be completed prior to final verification and condition unless otherwise agreed in writing. So if there were any repairs that were agreed to for whatever reason, the, the contract says they have to be done prior to close of escrow. Unless, which is dangerous, unless there's agreement that says, no, the seller can fix this after close. Hmm. There's probably some cases where that's okay. In most cases, I would say that's probably a problem. Probably don't want to do that, okay? Um, so again, and by the way, all repairs have to be negotiated in advance. You can't just throw things in at the last minute. I mean, just that just doesn't work that way. Okay. Final verification. This is your walkthrough. Okay. Final verification of condition. Buyer shall have the right final inspection of the property within five days. It says within five days. You can do that on day five. You can do that on on the day before funding and recording. But you certainly should do it. Okay. With again, the default is within five days prior to close of escrow. However, this is not a contingency of the sale. So in other words, if the buyer doesn't do it, it's not a contingency, okay? Um, and it's solely to confirm that the property is maintained pursuant to paragraph 9. If you remember paragraph 9, it basically says you've got to maintain the property in materially the same condition as it was when the buyer wrote the offer. This is not the time for the buyer to do their home inspection, okay? This is not, oh, I didn't do a home inspection. I think I'll do it now. You know, let me crawl under the house. Oh, by the way, I brought my home inspector with me. That's not what this is. This is, I'm going in. The carpet's still here. The paint looks pretty much the same, okay? All the fixtures are still in place. This is the worst, and so many agents do this all the time. It drives me mad. Buyers do final walkthroughs, and they come back with a list of 15 things that are wrong with the property. That is not the appropriate time to come back, because all of those 15 things were already wrong with the property. 
Well, the toilet handle is broken in the bathroom. Uh-huh. And it was broken in the bathroom, you know, 30 days ago and, and 12 days ago. Now the buyer comes in and says, fix the toilet handle. Not the way to do it, okay? And this is also not the time to address non-cosmetic or, or cosmetic issues. Yes, yep, the carpet is dirty. It needs to be cleaned. You're right, and it was dirty and it needed to be cleaned 30 days ago. And there's a chip in the sink in the bathroom. Yep, you're right, and there's a chip in the sink 30 days ago, okay? So these are material deals with the property. Uh, in our current market, this is kind of because there's so much bank-owned stuff and there's so much distressed stuff, the buyer's agents have just kind of been beat up and they understand that, hey, okay, you know, we're looking for the big stuff. When the market shifts, and, and, and we're all looking forward to the market shifting and changing a little bit, this was one of my biggest pet peeves, is buyer's agents coming with laundry lists of things two days before close of escrow and demanding they get fixed. And the reason it was one of my biggest pet peeves, who normally pays for that stuff? A lot of times it's the agents. Okay, the seller, I'm not going to do that. What are you talking about? Oh, I'm not going to close. So now you've got two agents looking at each other, $500 worth of handyman work, and because we didn't have the strength to control our buyers up front. But anyway, final verification. Prorations of property taxes and other items. Again, another very dry subject. And if you've been with us now for three hours and 24 minutes, congratulations. <laughs> this is another snoozer, okay? <coughs> but it's important. Buyers and sellers need to be able to have this explained to them in a fashion that they understand. Most agents don't understand this. It's very simple. Property taxes, homeowners association dues, rents, deposits, we talked about earlier. Anything that basically is paid on the property either in advance or in the rears is subject to a proration. The big ones are property taxes, interest on loans, um, again, rents. We talked earlier about the rents um, um, on, on a, if a property is being taken over by a, a, an investor and the tenant's going to stay. And it's very simple. If the property closes on the 15th of the month, the seller is responsible for whatever was due up until the 15th of the month, and the buyer is responsible for everything that's due after that. And whatever that division is, it takes place upon the day escrow closes, whether it's the 1st or the 15th or the 12th. Most escrows don't close on the 1st of the month, but even if they do, you still have things that need to be prorated like property taxes. Okay? Um, so, um, now where it gets tricky is, well, I don't remember how the taxes get paid in December 15th and April 15th, and they get paid in advance, and I'm confused. Well, you need to, oops, well, you need to... You need to understand that, okay? But I want to keep it simple for the purposes of this class. Um, all of this stuff gets prorated, and basically the party who owns the property at that particular date and time is responsible. The buyers are responsible for it um, from close of escrow forward. And again, we can, we'll talk a lot more about this when we do our escrow class and our prelim class, because that's where a lot of this stuff comes in place. But just to keep it simple really quick, we need two quick examples. <coughs> Let's take a homeowner's association payment. Homeowner's association payments are normally paid in advance. So let's just suppose the homeowner's association dues are $100 a month. Okay? It's now um, the first of the month and um, my December dues are due. So I own the property and I'm selling it. I pay my $100. Bucks. Okay? Well, we close escrow on the 15th of the month. Well, I have now paid the second half of the month for the buyer. $50 of that needs to be credited back to me, prorated, prorated back. So they debit the buyer and they credit the seller. And this buyer is it basically, we talk about again closing costs. Buyers get confused. Why am I paying closing costs? What is this $50 for homeowners association? Well, you're, you now own the house. Your homeowners association dues are due for the remainder, for the remainder of, the, of the month. So, and frankly, the seller already paid them. So now you have to credit them back. <coughs> Where sellers get confused on this a lot, if you're primarily a listing agent with the real sellers, I gave you the example where homeowners association dues are normally paid in advance. Mortgage payments are normally paid in the rears. So your December 1st mortgage payment, a lot of sellers think when they make the December 1st mortgage payment, 
that they're paying for the month of December. So I paid my mortgage in advance. It's not how it works on a mortgage payment. On a mortgage payment, your December 1st mortgage payment actually covers November, okay? Unlike rent, okay? You get to live in the property basically free for the month, then you pay and, and, and what's referred to in the rears, okay? Use that same example. Now a, we close escrow on December 15th. The seller has paid their December mortgage payment. They think that they've already covered December, and they think they have a $15 credit coming back. Well, guess what? They don't. When they get the demand to pay off their loan, they still owe 15 days of interest for December. When you're dealing with a lister or listing and you're representing the seller, when you're figuring out a seller's net sheet, you need to know that, especially on sellers who are expecting every single penny back. And that can make a big, big difference. And we do a whole class on net sheets, and we're going to talk about that when we do the net sheet class down the road. But prorations are important to say the least. Okay, we're getting close to the home stretch. We've only got um, a few pages left, and the last couple pages, quite honestly, go very, very fast. Um, okay, um, we are on the, where are we? We're on the top of page um, six. Um, selection of services. This talks about escrow, title, termite companies, inspectors, so on and so forth. This is kind of our agent's um, little bit of, you know, get out of jail free card. Oops. What just happened? Oh, yeah. Stop. Okay. Um, brokers do not guarantee the performance of vendors, service, or product providers whether referred by the broker or selected to or by buyer, okay, or by the seller or anybody. We do have to be careful when we recommend people though. If we're going to recommend a termite guy, darn it, be prepared to stand behind that termite guy. But we're basically saying we don't guarantee them. You have to be careful when you're certainly dealing with in-house escrow, which we have now. If they're not doing a good job, don't use them, okay? And let me know, because they should be doing a good job for us. Multiple listing, this is kind of a disclosure um, even though, by the way, I was going to say it was a disclosure that the, the brokers or our agents are representing, this contract is not between, we're not a party to this contract. This contract is between buyer and seller, okay? However, as, as the agents in the California Association of Realtors who drafted this, we kind of put in this little disclosure to the buyers and the sellers basically saying, we use a multiple listing service, okay? We use the MLS. Most people understand that now, okay? And we report in the MLS that the property is for sale, that it's closed escrow, the price goes in there, the terms go in there, sometimes there's some pictures in there, and there's people that can have access to that information. Sometimes buyers and sellers get freaked out by that. What do you mean you're going to tell the world how much I bought this house for? Yeah, that's just how it works. It's public record. Okay? Equal housing opportunity. You sell anybody. Green, yellow, black, purple, orange, you know, whatever it happens to be. Okay? Equal housing. The property is sold in compliance with the federal, state, and local anti-discrimination laws. Pretty straightforward stuff. Attorney's fees. What they're referring to on attorney's fees, if there is any legal action or proceeding or arbitration that comes out of this, um, again, keep in mind, this agreement contract is between buyer and seller. This has nothing to do with agents. The prevailing buyer or seller shall be entitled to reasonable attorney's fees. So in other words, if there is action taken between a buyer and seller and the seller wins and the buyer loses, whatever attorney's fees that the buyer or the seller incur, accrued to defend that action or take that action, the other party is responsible to pay. Definitions. We talked about this three out. Yes? There's a question regarding the vendors mm -hmm. that you recommend to buyers yep. or sellers or whatever. Yep. What is your take on that? Do you give them like three? Because we have so many uh, brochures, different vendors, and all yeah, that. I mean, you really should. I mean, choice. The, the, the giving them two or three people to choose from is it certainly doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. I got to be honest with you, I don't normally do that. I either refer or I don't refer. In other words, if I, if there's a good termite guy, I'll say use ABC termite. Okay, I probably should say ABC or DEF or XYZ or whatever happens to be. Um, it's keep in mind most of your clients they don't know they don't know a good escrow a good termite a good title company a good home inspector um, but you, you have to be careful Re recommending three certainly is a good practice it's certainly a good practice um, okay definitions we talked about definitions earlier 
if you, this is why certain parts of the contract you want to, if your seller or buyer have to go and, un, and read what acceptance means, you probably have not done a good job in explaining the contract to them. But this will, this will explain it. I'm not going to go through all of these. It defines a copy. Okay? Copy means copy by any means, including photocopy, NCR, facsimile, or electronic. So you can send an email with a copy of the contract. That's sufficient. Days means calendar days. Days after means the specific number of calendar days after whatever the occurrence is. So it's a, if it says three days after, three days after acceptance, if we accepted it on Monday, then the three days would be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay? So this is where things get so muddled up because people are counting the day it was accepted. And, and it doesn't sound like that big deal, but it certainly can be a big deal electronic signatures, um, law, uh, all the rest of that. So it has all sorts of definitions within the contract. I'm not going to go through all of these, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, and, and again, it's the type of thing that needs to be read by your client. Um, okay, the bottom of page 6 talks about, this is going to come down one hopefully, talks about broker's compensation. Um, when this comes down a little bit, the broker's compensation is not dealt with in the contract. It used to be years and years ago that in the bottom of page 8, we used to put our commissions on the contract. 3% of the sales price would go to the listing agent, 3% of the sales price would go to the, um, would go to the um, buyer's agent, whatever it happened to be. Um, we, that, that's been gone for years and years and years. Our commission is dealt with in the listing agreement. The listing agreement outlines the compensation, and it outlines what percentage of the compensation goes to the buying side and the selling side of the transaction. What this refers to is um, broker compensation. Seller or buyer or both agrees to pay compensation to brokers as specified in a separate written agreement between the broker and the seller or the buyer. We know it's not common for us to use buyer's broker's agreements in Southern California. But it's possible you could have a buyer pay you a commission, not traditional. But anyway, the bottom line, if, if your buyer is asking you how you're going to get compensated, in most cases, unless you have a buyer's broker's agreement, the compensation to the buyer's agent is paid out of the proceeds from the seller's proceeds. The buyer's not paying. You would be amazed how many buyers do not understand that. It's another one of those things, and we're going to talk about this. We're going to do a class tomorrow, which will be much shorter than this. We're going to do a class tomorrow on presenting offers and talking with buyers about this. If you attend that class, a lot of the background that we did today will be helpful in tomorrow's class. It will be two hours, not five hours. Um, <clears throat> but with that in mind, <clears throat> the um, um, buyers don't understand how commissions are paid. It's another one of those things when you first make contact with the buyer, and you're asking them all these questions. Are you going to buy? When are you going to buy? What's your timeline? Do you have the money? The deposit? Have you talk to a lender? You want to talk to them about, oh, and by the way, just so we're clear, um, let me explain to you how I get paid as the agent representing a buyer. Okay? Explain to them that you don't work out on an hourly basis. Explain to them that in most cases, the buyer is not going to write you a check for their compensation. Explain to them how you get paid. It does two things for them. Number one, it hopefully will give them a little bit more respect for your time, okay? That they understand that you, you don't get paid unless you close in that transaction. And i got to tell you, and I learned this the hard way, I've had buyers that after it was all said and done and we couldn't get to the uh, transaction, you know, I'm like, God, what happened? How come well, I don't get it? How come you, we can't? No, oh, Lance, I just don't have the money to pay you. You don't have the money to pay me? Yeah, we got the down payment and the closing cost, but you know, I know we, we got I gotta pay you, right? Don't I owe you like six percent? Or don't I gotta pay you three percent? I'm like, oh my god, are you kidding me? That's why we haven't written a contract in the last four months. Um, so I'm telling you, don't assume that your customers understand how we get paid. Okay? And, and don't assume your sellers understand that either. A lot of sellers think that they've got to get paid. Um, you looking for me? Okay. How long we got? We're almost done. We probably got another two hours. So, <laughs> at any rate, um, you want to pause it real quick, or what do we got? Okay, then I'm gonna keep going then. Oh, we are. Are we gonna pause it? Okay. What's up? Okay. So, um, so on the compensation, make sure 
your clients understand how you get paid. It seems so elementary that you just assume that buyers, there's, there's people who have their real estate license that interview to come to work as real estate agents have taken all of this time, energy, and effort to get their real estate license and they have no idea how they actually get paid in this business. Don't assume your buyers and sellers understand it. Um, and again, this is probably not the best time to have this conversation with your buyer. Your sellers, you've already got it at that point because you've got a listing contract. But again, make sure your sellers understand it as well because some sellers think they actually, especially the short sale sellers, they think that they've got to pay you in advance. They don't have any money. So make sure they understand how the compensation works. Okay, joint escrow instructions to the escrow holder. If you remember when we first started, the very first title of the contract, real estate purchase agreement and joint escrow instructions. Here are your <coughs> joint escrow instructions. This is the part of the contract that basically is the instructions to the escrow holder. Okay, And it goes through all of the pertinent parts of the contract and it basically gives the escrow the instructions on how to proceed. Keep in mind, and we do a whole other class on escrow, escrow is a neutral third party that is basically designed to do what they are instructed. That's why they call them escrow instructions. You will close the escrow based upon the certain set of instructions. Sales price, cost being paid, inspections need to be done, whatever those items are, and they're all outlined in here, but this is the escrow instruction portion of the contract, bottom of page six. Okay, top of page seven, and we're on the home stretch here. Liquidated damages. We talked about liquidated damages when we started talking about the earnest money deposit at the very beginning of this class, okay? This is what controls the deposit. It's very simple. If buyer fails to complete the purchase because of buyer's default, Okay, buyers breach the contract. Seller shall retain as liquidated damages, it's just a fancy word of saying damages, okay? The deposit actually paid. So whatever the deposit was, if it was $100 or 3%, whatever the deposit actually paid, if the property is a dwelling of no more than one to four units, one of which the buyer intends to occupy, there's always that one to four rule then the amount retained shall be no more than 3% of the purchase price. Okay, So the maximum that the seller can get as damages from the buyer for the buyer's breach is either the actual amount of deposit that's paid or 3%. So when you use that example earlier where we said that the buyer was going to put $50,000 in and the maximum would have been $3,000, contractually, the most that the seller could have gotten was 3000 bucks, But that doesn't mean that the seller can't tie up that $50,000 and be really nasty about it. So liquidated damages is just a nice way to cut through what really truly are the damages. And the reverse would also be true. Let's suppose that the seller feels that because the buyer breached that the seller was damaged by 50000 bucks. Sorry, the most that the seller could get is actually paid or 3%. Now, this is the kicker. Release of funds will require signed release instructions by both buyer and seller. Or a judicial decision, which means somebody has to sue somebody else, or an arbitration award. Okay? So if the buyer and seller don't mutually agree we're going to give the money back or we're going to split it or we're going to do whatever it's going to be, it sits in escrow. And it basically stays in escrow, I think, for three years and then after a period of time um, defined. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's three years, and it escheats to the state. It's another one of those terms that we find on the real estate exam. Okay? And all that means is the escrow says, I don't know what to do with it anymore, and they give it to the state of California, and that goes in the general fund, whatever it happens to be. Okay? So, um, so, liquidated damages, 3%. It's very simple. Write your contracts with approximately a 3% deposit, and you'll be good. Now, a lot of buyers are like, oh, geez, it's a $500,000 sales price. Oh, geez, that's a lot of money. That's $15,000. Well, yeah, it's a $500,000 sales price. Okay? In my opinion, a $1,000 or a $3,000 earnest money deposit on a $500,000 sales price, that's no good. Okay? Now, maybe it doesn't have to be $15,000, but I would say probably minimum ten. Okay? I think five would be bare bones, 1%, bare bones. 
I like larger deposits, but I really like 3% deposits, whether I'm representing the buyer or the seller. Okay? Okay, that's our liquidated down, which by the way, you notice we've got some initial blocks here. Parties need to agree to that. If the liquidated damages clause is not initial, the liquidated damages clause is not applied. 95% of the time, buyers and sellers are initial in that. I recommend you have an initial. Okay, dispute resolution. We've got two paragraphs, mediation, arbitration, which is basically most of the rest of this page. Um, basically, and again, there's an initial required when we get down to the bottom. Buyers and sellers agree to mediate a dispute. I have a case going on right now where a buyer is suing in small claims court a seller over a dispute on a deposit. Technically, the buyer jumped ahead. You're not supposed to sue. You're supposed to mediate, okay? Before resorting to arbitration or court action. So in this case, the buyer actually is in breach of contract again. Um, they, they were in breach the first time, in my opinion. But now they're actually in breach again because they did not mediate before they took court action. So I don't know what the seller is going to do, but the seller could go into small claims court, pull out page 7 of the contract, and say, would you please dismiss my this case, Your Honor? The buyer agreed to mediate before court action, and they have not initiated a, medi a mediation proceedings. Okay? Um, but basically, mediation is just that. It's an effort to get the parties together. You pay a mediator, and you sit down, um, and you try to resolve the dispute. I've had mixed success with mediation. Um, and then, of course, the second um, level, if you can't resolve it during from a mediation dispute, then you agree to arbitration. And the contract does state arbitration is binding. Okay? So you get in front of an arbitrator, and the arbitrator says, yes, you win, you lose. Well, that's binding. It's binding arbitration clause in the agreement. Okay? If I page down, this is the balance of the arbitration clause and the buyer's um, and seller's initial, okay? And then it's got some additional mediation and arbitration clause, which excludes some issues. The following matters shall be excluded, judicial, non-judicial foreclosure actions, and what have you. But, you know, bankruptcy, yeah, yeah, probate, so on and so forth. But generally speaking, most of our stuff is going to fall within the mediation arbitration, okay? It talks about brokers. Brokers should not be obligated or compelled to mediate or arbitrate unless they agree to do so in writing. Okay? Any brokers participating in the mediation or arbitration should not be deemed a party to the agreement, which is true. So if the buyer and seller are mediating, we might be called as a witness or something like that, but we're not a party to the agreement. But we may have a problem with a buyer or a seller. Okay? Um, normally, it's hard to sue a buyer because normally we don't have a contract with the buyer. Okay? A little easier to sue a seller. We've got a listing contract um, with the seller. Um, but it's not. It's it's very rare, and frankly, I've never, I've never, I've never, never taken any action against the buyer or seller, even though there's been lots of times where I probably could. So it's just not good business. Terms and conditions. This is kind of the part of the contract where I like to sit back to the buyer and seller with these two, paragraph 27 and 28, and kind of do the, are we all in? Do we completely understand? Have we covered everything? Okay. These are the terms and conditions. Did we forget something? Okay, um, because basically this is where we're going to put it. If there's something we forgot, it's too late. So this is again kind of restates that the this is an offer to purchase the above property on the above terms and conditions. All right. Time is of the essence. How many times have we referred to a date, a time, paragraph 14, whatever it happens to say? We're telling the buyers and the sellers, if it says do something in seven days, do it in seven days. If it says we're going to close on January 15th, we're going to close on January 15th. If we don't, we're probably in breach. Somebody is in breach of contract. It's a big deal. So the time, and again, it's another one of those portions of the, um, of the, of the contract, which in my opinion, we as real estate professionals have done a poor job. We have allowed these dates to become target dates. I cannot tell you how many times I've had an agent on the opposite side of the transaction say, hey, we're shooting to close on December 15th. We're shooting to close? 
we're not shooting to close. Our contract says we're closing on December 15th. Shooting to close sounds to me like you're not going to make it. Like we're just going to wish that we're going to close. Okay? That's not the way to do business. We're either going to close or we're not going to close. And if we're not going to close, let's find out why now. And let's get that addressed in some sort of an amendment or an extension. So the time is of the essence clauses. Again, it's, it's really overlooked. And I, and I don't want the agents working within our umbrella to, to you know, be one. I don't want us to be average. We need to be, we, we don't, I don't even want to be above average. We need to be exceptional. And that basically means that we need to do our jobs and we need to we need to act as professionals. As far as the mediation arbitration, who yep. is that uh, the mediator? Does that have to be a lawyer? Does that have to be another no. experienced no. realtor? No, probably neither of those. Uh, okay. Maybe a retired um, a retired. The the Association of Realtors has okay. mediation arbitration services. The you can um, do a Google search for mm -hmm. mediators, arbitrators, um, no, most cases that are real estate related. Um, a, a, again, a realtor involved will say, hey, contact the Association of Realtors or do a Google search now on mediator arbitrators. Um, you, you pay them five, six hundred bucks and you go to, a, a lot of times it's a retired attorney or a judge or something like that. Um, both parties have to agree, make sure that someone's fair, okay? And then you go and the mediation is just, it's just that. You sit down, you tell the story, the mediator says, hey, come on, can we agree? Um, and then which is different than the arbitration. The arbitration is more of a formal proceeding. If the mediator can't get the two parties to agree, then they, they leave the office and that's it. The arbitrator is a different deal. The arbitrator sits back and says, this is my decision. Right or wrong, okay? The, the arbitrator could be completely wrong. Well, it's a binding arbitration. It's done, okay? Now, I'm not a big fan of either. Having said that, both are preferable to litigation. Okay, and in most cases, we're not litigating big deals. Okay, and if we are, when I say big deals, I mean large dollar amounts. If we've got you know like tens of thousands of dollars that we're involved in, you're probably going to end up in, in court somewhere. Okay, um, but most cases we're talking about deposits. That's most of the time when we're going to run into these things. Buyers and sellers can't agree. We've got one going on right now. I think it's a two thousand or three thousand dollar earnest money deposit. Buyer and seller just cannot agree. That's the one, the example I just gave you. Um, okay. Um, last page. And we're not going to do the, the BIA, Buyer's Inspection Advisory. So we're on page eight. We're almost done. Expiration of offer. We talked about this in the very beginning of the class. The default expiration of offer. This offer shall be deemed revoked. Revoked. And, de and, uh, and deposit shall be returned unless the offer is signed by the seller and a copy of the signed offer is personally delivered by, excuse me, personally received by the buyer, which is not normally how this works, which is why you need to put or by you, buyer's agent, or by Lance Martin, okay, um, who is authorized to receive it, okay. But if you, I, I see this blank all the time. If this is blank, you know what the listing agent has to do? I have to go personally find the buyer. How am I going to do that? Okay? You need to put in the buyer's agent's name here. Okay? Who's authorized to receive it by 5 p.m. on the third day after this offer is signed by the buyer. So if it's signed today, December 5th, by 5 p.m. 6th, 7th, 8th, 5 p.m. on the 8th, this has to be returned, accepted by the seller. Or you can change it. You can come over here and you can check the box and change it. And you can put in a different time and you can put in a different date. Most buyer's agents don't do that. Which when we talked about earlier, well gosh, it's taking the seller you know, two weeks to respond. That's a problem. It's a problem for a lot of people, but just contractually it's a problem because the offer basically is dead. We've kind of become accustomed to it. That's just part of that's how the REO business works. We just hurry up and we wait and we wait and we wait and we just hope it comes back. We're not going to be in an REO market forever. We're going to be dealing with real buyers and sellers again here coming up pretty soon. Um, and this is really, really important. Okay? 
Um, again, we've got on here the buyer has read and acknowledges receipt and copy of offer and agrees to confirmation of agency. We talked about that. Okay, we've got the date. It should be more or less, should be the same date, not more or less. This should be the sign, the same date of the offer. Buyer signs their full name. Buyer prints their full name as printed on page one. John A. Smith. Okay, well, let's print their name, John A. Smith. If you can't read their signature, I'm okay with that. Okay, if their signature is a big X, whatever. But if it says John A. Smith on page one, I want it to say John A. Smith on page two. And the same thing with the second buyer. If you have more than, than two buyers signing, make room. Okay? Um, address. A lot of buyers have problems giving their address. I don't understand that. We need an address. Okay? Have them put their home address, some sort of mailing address. Additional signature addendum. Ah, we just talked about that. If we have additional signatures, if you have five or six signatures, which is very rare, you can use the additional signature addendum. I've had them sign in here all the time. I don't have a problem with that. A little more tricky if you're putting it into the, it's harder to do if you're typing it in the wind forms because it doesn't allow you to put these extra names. You have to print that in. But you can use, of course, the additional signature addendum. i got to tell you, I don't think I've ever seen anybody use it. Ever. Okay. Okay, acceptance. The seller basically has a few options. The buyer agent has now delivered us the offer. They've signed the offer. It's valid. We've taken the offer to the seller. The seller basically can do a few things. The seller can accept, the seller can reject, or the seller can count. Okay? Um, or the seller could refuse to respond, which in effect is the same as a rejection. Okay? So, accepting of the offer, seller warrants that seller is the owner. Okay, well, that's a good place to start. Okay, so the person signing this says, I own it. They also say, I have authority. That kind of gets back to maybe it's a corporation that's selling it or whatever it happens to be. Or maybe there's someone with the power of attorney. Okay, so I've got, I own it. I have the authority. The seller accepts the above offer, agrees to sell the property on the above terms and conditions and agrees that the above, uh, to the above confirmation of agency, on, which is on page one. Cobalt Banker Pioneer Real Estate representing this party, Cobalt Banker Pioneer Real Estate representing that party. Okay? Seller has read and acknowledged a receipt of this agreement. They've read it, my God. Okay? And authorizes the broker to deliver a signed copy to the buyer or the buyer's agent. Okay? So, if the seller accepts date, sign, print, address. Simple, okay? Um, if the seller wants to counter, pretty straightforward, hopefully we've all done this, check the box, put the date over there, and you prepare a counter offer. Price is 110, I'm not gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, whatever it happens to be. We'll talk more about that in a different class, okay? But if they're gonna counter, use the CAR form, CA form, CO, counter offer form, dated, and again, that because so, it's probably going to be a different date. Okay, that might be the day after, two days, whatever it happens to be. Okay, so very important if you're going to do a counter, check that box. Okay, seller signs. We've got the additional signature addendum that the sellers could use. Okay, this confirmation of acceptance down here is basically very rarely do agents or sellers or buyers do this. Rather, the seller now sends this back to the buyer. The buyer has basically received it. What should happen is the buyer's then should initial, or the buyer's authorized agent should initial that says, hey, we got it. And this date and this time should fall within the expiration of offer time. I got to tell you, this part of the offer, very rarely done. Okay, I think it's just a function of the banks and the REOs and all the rest that we just don't do it. Mm -hmm. This is important though. This is important when we're dealing with real buyers and real sellers and people that are getting antsy and want to get them committed. This is very, very important and, and again, very rarely done. But again, if you read through it, a copy of the signed acceptance was personally received by buyer or the buyer's authorized agent. Again, who am I authorized? And this is my date and time. A binding agreement is created when a copy of the signed acceptance is personally received by buyer. Yada, yada, yada. Okay? So, um, what's up? Okay, we're almost done. The, the very last, another few minutes, I'm going to get to the brokers. 
Okay, now this, we are now done with the contract. Contract, class over, time hour finish, okay? The last portion of page eight basically, basically identifies who the brokers are involved. And it also, the very first thing it says is real estate brokers are not parties to the agreement, okay? We are below the signature line. This is just more information than anything else, okay? And agency confirmations have stated in, in paragraph two, page one, paragraph two, as um, is specified in paragraph 382, agent who submitted the offer um, for buyer acknowledges receipt of deposit. Did we talk about that? Receipt of deposit? Okay. If specified in 3A2, who has the deposit? Is it the buyer's agent or is it the buyer? And it's very clear if it's specified, <coughs> agent has the receipt, the deposit receipt, receipt for deposit rather. Cooperating broker compensation. The listing broker agrees to pay the cooperating broker based upon whatever it states in the MLS and so on and so forth. So whatever agreement, we have, and by the way, that can't be changed. If the MLS compensation says 2.5% to the buyer's agent, the buyer's agent is going to accept 2.5%. The buyer's agent, per the MLS rules, is not allowed to negotiate a higher commission. Okay. If you don't like the commission it states in the MLS, don't show the property, okay? You can't go at that point in time um, and say, as part of your negotiations, oh, by the way, you're going to pay me 3%. And, we, and that may sound like, oh, wait a minute, come on, man. The Meyer buyers love this property. They want to pay me. I understand the argument, but what we're trying to avoid when we're negotiating the contract, we want to negotiate price and terms with the buyer and the seller. We don't want to, the commissions to enter into that negotiation. That has to be agreed to in advance. And that's basically exactly what this is saying. Listing firm is here. Company, okay. You know, selling broker firm, Cobalt Banker, DBA. License number. Buy, signed by the agent. Your license number, okay. This is the company license number. This is the agent's license number. You date it. You put your address in there, fax, email, so on and so forth. Same thing on the listing side. Company goes here, not agent. Company DRE number goes here, not the agent. Agent signs here. I print my name, um, John Smith, sign John Smith. Agent's license number goes here. I see this, this is wrong all the time, okay? Company broker, company you work for goes on selling firm, listing firm with a company DRE number. Agent signs below. You don't have to have the broker, doesn't have to sign your offers for you. You guys have a license, you're, you're capable of doing that. Um, then our escrow portion is down here. Um, remember, escrow instructions, right? Escrow gets page eight. They need to basically acknowledge that they're accepting this as our escrow instructions, okay? Um, do they have the deposit? Um, do they have a counter offer? Statement of information, all the sort of stuff. Who's going to be our escrow holder? Who's going to be our point of contact? So on and so forth. Okay. And then we've got our last two items, which I'm sure everyone's happy to see, since we're now pushing four hours. Um, the presentation of the offer. Broker listing broker presented this offer to seller. Do we get that a lot? My offer never got it presented. Okay. Well, yeah, I did. Okay. I'm telling you right here. It got presented, and it got rejected. No counter offer is being made. This offer was rejected. Okay. Now, if you notice, the presentation side, there's no place for the seller to say it was presented. Now, there is a place for the seller to initial that it was it was it was rejected. Okay. Um, a lot of buyers agents feel that their offers are not getting presented, and this is where you want to you want to put the listing agent on the spot. Hey. Tell me you presented it and tell me when, okay? Or you say the seller rejected it, have them sign off on the bottom of page eight. I got to tell you, probably one out of a hundred agents that have an offer rejected actually ask for this. I respect them for that. In some ways, it makes me feel like they don't believe the listing agent. They don't feel I'm being honest with them, but I understand that in this environment. But contractually, this is where you would ask for those. And it's perfectly appropriate if you're representing the buyer to ask for this. Hey, did you present my offer? Put it in writing. And put it in writing basically means sign it. Yes, I presented it. Okay? Did the seller reject it? Yep. 
please ask them to initial. Now, will the banks initial these? Not normally. Okay. But again, we're not putting this in the context of an REO market. In the real world, you want your seller to sign this. If you're dealing with a real seller and they don't want to accept the offer, you want them to present it to them. No, it's terrible. I don't like it. Okay, just put your initials on the bottom of the page eight. I'll put it in the file and I'll send it back to the buyer's agent. Okay, so that is, now I'll just, I'll just page down one more time. Buyer's inspection advisory, we're going to do the last two pages under the disclosure part. When we do our disclosure class, tomorrow, we're going to do that later on in the calendar. Um, so we'll deal with that later. But that's our eight-page RPA. Um, so if you've been referred to this video for <laughs> training purposes, it probably means you came to me with a silly question and I said, watch this four-hour video, then come back to me and ask me a question and we'll see what we go. Thank you, Alex. All right. And you guys are troopers, <laughs> considering that you really only were expected to stay here for, um, how do I turn this off? Power?